So I would um, like to call to order the South Burlington City Council meeting of Monday, October 7th, 2019. And we'll begin with our Pledge of Allegiance. Tom, you want to start us, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Instructions on exiting the building in case of emergency? Uh, <laughs> in case of emergency tonight, Dave's just pointing out our diminutive uh, fire extinguisher. In what? case of emergency, <laughs> we'll use that. But in case of emergency tonight, if we need to leave the building, uh, please proceed out this room from one of these two doors. Go out the building, proceed to the south, around the building to the south, and gather in the parking lot around the other building. If these doors are for some reason blocked, please go back out into the lobby and back out the main entrance that you came in and again gather at that parking lot beyond the building to the south. Tom Hubbard and I will make sure that the city or the uh, building is cleared. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, agenda review. So we have some changes. Um, item number seven, the update on the consolidated trash hauling study is not ready for tonight. So I would suggest that we move um, item 13 into that slot, the update on the status of the consensus app pilot project. And while they may not take half an hour, unless people have tons of questions, um, we then will take up some other items, maybe financials and um, the committee assignments, depending on the um, time available. So, um, so are there any other additions or deletions that people wish to propose? Just the other business about. Oh, I'm sorry. And then the other, un, under other business, we have some proposed dates for steering committees, which is a brief report, but we'll tell you. Um, okay, moving on. Comments and questions from the public not related to the agenda. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to make a statement? Seeing none, we'll move on to announcements and the city manager's report. So, Tim, would you like to begin? Any sure. announcements? Uh, I spent an hour on Saturday and an hour and a half on Sunday painting the side of the food shelf with my lovely wife and the primary artist, Jamie, I forgot her last name. So, it, it's uh, most of the flowers and garden, the graphics are established and filled in, but now it's gonna be back painted with black. So you started with black, you went to white, <laughs> and it's going to be black. So it's going to be all these took me flower things with a black background. An hour is, and a half to spray I, that. I know it. Good job, though. Thank yeah. you. It was black. Yeah. <laughs> it was black. I, <laughs> I, I, you know, that's the way yeah. these things work. That's um, artist for you. I attended the committee symposium like uh, the other counselors did uh, two weeks ago. Uh, I also attended the Wilson Road design meeting last week and a meeting with... Uh, Justin and Kevin of some residents that live on Mary Street discussing the possible opening of that street. Thank you. David? Uh, nothing to add at this time. Okay. Megan? Huh. Um, we had a phone meeting on Wednesday, uh, a working team uh, preparing and organizing two forums, uh, community forums on domestic violence. <coughs> been declared Domestic Violence Awareness Month here in South Burlington and we are having our first community forum this Thursday night over in Tuttle Middle School in the cafeteria. It begins at 5.30 with some supper and at 6 o'clock we will start the event and we'll talk more later but the, the second forum will be held on the 30th. Um, Helen and I also met with the chair of the DRB, uh, Matt Coda, on Friday uh, after our um, our event that Coralie planned with all of the committees reporting to the council, which I thought was really effective as opposed to having them come before us in meetings. So I want to thank you for that, Coralie. Um, we, I felt that 
there needed to be some follow through. I think Helen did too, but I'll let her speak to that. Um, and so I reached out to Matt and we scheduled a meeting and I thought it was a good discussion on Friday and we'll talk more about issues that pertain to the DRB tonight. Great, thank you. Tom? I'm going to that Thursday thing and I didn't know there was gonna be supper, so you yes. just made my week, so I'm yes. looking forward to that. We should maybe see if there can be coffee. I don't know. <laughs> Not too late to put your order. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to say, and hopefully the other paper covers it, December 8th, Ugly Sweater Run. I hope to see you all out running and registering. So it's a great event, dog friendly, so bring your dogs. Because you moved it. Sunday, December 8th was spend the day. It's down over here? Yes, so it's going to be out of the middle Where? school, oh. and which is great, and it's going to run down the brand new Market Street, because Market oh. Street will be open, so it's nice. going to do the big Kennedy Drive block. So you should see registration information soon, but I hope to see all your, okay. your ugliest sweaters on December 8th. You're, can, I, can I jump in here and add something if you're done? Um, we went up to Montreal on Saturday and um, saw they have in their botanical gardens, they have um, a light, um, it's called the Garden in Light. And so they have a Chinese garden with the Chinese lanterns. They have um, a First Nation garden and they, they lit the tree and they have a Japanese garden. And there were some really interesting ideas and City Center Park is so beautiful. If we're gonna be having events like the Ugly Sweater Run there, I mean, there are things that could really be done with all of the trees and the paths. Um, I just, it really struck my fancy. It, uh, they use, for instance, um, LEDs, of course, but they lit disco balls and the glitter on the trees, it was magnificent. Oh, cool. It just looked like a magical wonderland. It was, and so there are just, there were really, you know, fantastic effects for very little you know energy usage and, and it just was a, an incredible event so I just wanted to pass that on yeah. um, we should reroute <laughs> through City <laughs> Park Dumont Park I would yeah, it's, City Center Park it's beautiful mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's cool all right um, well I went to the committee symposium also and I would echo Megan's thoughts I thought it was very effective really um, I mean, it was quick, and we got a tiny bit behind, but I think um, what we heard and the conversations we had with the different committees was really um, very, very helpful. So thank you. And I understand they had some good training as well, so that's, that's wonderful. Um, Kevin and I met with the school leaders and discussed um, Market Street and what's happening with um, finishing Market Street and the entrance into the school, and I'm happy to report that um, both Elizabeth and, and David were very pleased with both the communication, and I guess they're, they are attending the, <coughs> is it weekly? Um, construction meeting. Construction too. meeting, so I think that has helped, and they've been able to um, let parents and teachers and students know what to expect, so it seems like we're on a, a good footing there in terms of um, that transition. So that was very good news. And we also um, talked about our steering committees and under other business. Um, Kevin, I will let you know what we sort of have planned and some dates. Um, I also, and Megan went, was there as well, as was Tom. Um, there was a meeting um, regarding the higher ground um, proposal, I guess, with uh, Burton, and they had a meeting um, in a brewery downtown. Of course, I went to the wrong brewery, so I was late. I, you know, I don't, I don't drink beer, so I didn't know where this brewery was. How could you make a mistake like that? I had my, in my mind it was a different brewery, you know. But anyway, I got to the right one, <laughs> and try them all, right? Um, and um, we listened, and it was interesting to hear what um, Burton and Higher Ground have in their um, vision of what their proposal might look like. And then the, the, I thought it was very good that the public were able to identify many of the issues of concern that they have in terms of the noise and the impact. There were a number of people from Red Rocks or um, Queen City Park, um, South Burlington residents who were there and um, advocating for various things. 
So I thought um, it was a good start for communication and um, we'll see what transpires. I mean, they're still working on a, um, their proposal for the conditional use. Uh, did they say maybe the end of October? End of October. It seemed sort of quick to me in terms of um, the numbers of issues that were raised that they had were hoping to be able to address. And maybe if they just address it by saying "too bad," it won't take them long to put it together. But I, I didn't get that sense that that's where they were coming from. Um, I also um, had, a, there was a special airport committee meeting. Um, I just joined by phone and it was really just some additional little um, ex, uh, expenditures and um, proposals for improving some of the um, aspects of the airport, nothing really big, it was very quick. Um, I did, um, I was delighted to attend the installation of the UVM president um, and Tom was showcased carrying that, what do they call that thing? It's a mace. It's a very a heavy, mace. awkward it's this mace. big, heavy, heavy mace. Um, <laughs> he he let everyone in and um, there's a really nice luncheon and um, speeches and then the installation and some other um, presenters and, and I was very impressed and it was it was really really very nice good job very nice job I was impressed actually with the variety of people that um, Garamelli is that how you pronounce Garamella. it Garamella Garamella um, I'm assuming he um, asked different people to speak on his behalf and he had um, a poet and um, I don't know, I, I can't remember the other people, but it was just such a variety of aspects of his um, life and his um, education and interests. It really, oh, it was really very, uh, I thought it was very, very nice. Um, Kevin and I also met with the library board, I don't know when. Last Friday. Last Friday. And we talked about um, where we are with the building and um, the mall and so most of that was I mean can I show that sure. um, Kevin had met with um, Heather the the mall manager about uh, the need to extend the the, the uh, rent or the uh, for another year a little over a year it looks like and she seemed to think, while it's not a, fi a final yes, she felt that um, she would know by now if there were other larger entities coming into the mall um, between now and then, and she felt that we could pretty much count on having that extension. But that won't be finalized until January, so it's not a, an absolute, but we were certainly encouraged that we didn't need to sweat out where are we going to move the library. Um, I guess that's it. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Ellen. Um, just a reminder that the uh, SBBA fall meeting is tomorrow morning at 7.30 at the Doubletree in the uh, auditorium <clears throat> there in the conference center. And you're all invited. Um, we have our closing on the first parcel of the um, 180 Market Street project, which is the road um, parcel on Thursday. And so um, once we have the closing done, we can uh, push forward with beginning construction. We want to try to get the road in before the, the asphalt plants close. And so we, uh, our contractors are going to be uh, rushing to do that. Uh, Market Street still planned to be open on the uh, 15th, and we're looking at we're looking at a potential groundbreaking for a ribbon cutting and uh, joint ribbon cutting and brown, groundbreaking um, on the uh, is that November 13th? The 13th, the 13th of November. Of November. Uh, 
December. No, the 13th no, the of November. The 13th of November. It's tentative? So it's very tentative right now. It would probably be late morning. We thought we would combine both the groundbreaking for the new building and the uh, ribbon cutting at the same time and two major uh, city initiatives. So uh, stay tuned uh, for that. Um, we'll do it later. We could have some disco balls going. We could. <laughs> we won't have trees cool. yet. We'll have to wait. <laughs> and that pesky uh, wanting to get in when the, when the uh, press needs to get their uh, <laughs> stories out. Um, I went to the VLC town meeting, VLCT town meeting on Thursday. It was excellent. There were two meetings uh, in the afternoon about, <clears throat> about first responders and mental health, and uh, they were excellent. And um, Trevor was there, um, and the uh, chief of Newtown uh, during that horrible event was the lead speaker. Oh wow! And um, it was it was good. Um, I want to thank Tim for coming to the Mary Street meeting last week. We had uh, four residents from Mary Street who came in to meet with us. Uh, to talk about the proposed opening of Mary Street uh, shortly after the new year. Uh, we learned a great deal from them. Obviously, there are great concerns there. We have a situation um, that is not, it's just one of those situations you get sometimes where there's, there's no great alternative. We can continue to have traffic going through a parking lot, actually two parking lots, mm -hmm. or we can have a proper road opened to handle the traffic Either way, people are going to try to get from Market Street to Williston Road. Uh, the question of, is of timing and what we can do to um, create some um, safety um, measures for the Mary Street neighborhood and traffic calming measures uh, for that neighborhood. So at a minimum, we have agreed to push the opening back until the spring, uh, and then we are going to reevaluate. In the meantime, I've asked our team to accelerate the um, construction schedule for Garden Street connection. Mm -hmm. As you might know, Tim, uh, um, Tim McKenzie is finishing Garden Street from Market Street to the end of his property to the north. And then uh, we have that short segment to get through from there until to get to Midas Drive. And so I've asked the staff to accelerate that because any connection there is going to take some of the pressure off of Mary Street if and when it is open. Mm -hmm. so, um, but anyway, it was, it was a tough meeting. Uh, people were very concerned. Uh, also, I appreciate several of you, a couple, two, three of you came to the Williston Road Streetscape meeting um, the other, uh, la also last week. Good meeting, you know, to talk about uh, enhanced bike and pedestrian facilities, new street lights. Uh, and new um, new trees along there. Um, I want to bring up the symposium as well, not and for the sole purpose of recognizing Coralie for the work she did on that, and several of our other team members. Coralie, who else was intimately involved in that? So I'd like to say uh, Kathy Ann yep. um, and Travis Ladd, Holly Baker, um, Paul was engaged with that as well. Um, Ashley Parker. So that whole group, everybody worked together to make that happen. Yeah, I thought it was an outstanding program. Paul's here to thank you both for all the work you did on that and the continuation of the committee leadership forums that you've been hosting. Uh, I thought it was excellent. And then lastly, um, did we talk about the NCP at the last city council meeting? No. Um, I don't think we did. The final, the final. The NCP, the um, noise. Of the, of the uh, technical advisory committee. Yeah. No, was, you didn't. Was held two weeks ago, roughly. And uh, quoting uh, Paul Connor, um, they got 95% of what the city council wanted in our letter to them. So in your letter to them. So Paul had a couple of uh, issues that he raised at the meeting that they, they agreed to look at. And uh, all in all, uh, I think that the, the uh, airport and their consultants were highly responsive to <coughs> the letter that you sent <coughs> regarding the proposed provisions of the NCP. Has that been approved yet by the FAA, or that's just the request? It hasn't now, even been submitted. Yeah, now it goes to a public hearing later in October. It uh, goes to the Burlington City Council, I believe, in November. Once they've approved it, then it goes to the FAA. Uh, consultants are anticipating 
uh, and Nick were anticipating approval by the FAA perhaps in May. So. And we're hoping to get a, a copy of the final proposal prior to um, the Burlington City Council voting on it just to that's what we're trying for. We'll see if they can share it. Yeah. Paul? They should be able to share it. Yeah. I think. Yeah, Paul? Uh, Paul Connor, Director of Planning and Zoning. Two quick notes on that. One, um, what they gave us was the technical paper that will sort of be translated into the plan. So we didn't see the plan yet, so it's not, it's not there yet, but it's the bones of it. Um, and one of the other heartening things in the meeting was that the uh, FAA representative was speaking about their timeline for review and um, uh, indicated that, that they were interested in trying to accelerate the review at their end in order to be done before May 1st, which is the sort of, um, that's the, the schedule uh, for when the next fiscal year's funds become available. And so trying to be done uh, before that timeline so that the airport could apply for funds under the new program in the first year that it's eligible. So it was, it was nice to hear that from the FAA representative um, from there. And so. so it has to do with soundproofing, it has to do with home value assurance, or I can't remember All, the exact terms. Right, the various different programs that the City Council had. Yeah. Um, what was the 5% that we didn't get, if you can recall? Um, <laughs> The I, have to, I have to look back at my <laughs> notes, but I think that they, um, uh, the wording of um, the way that they talked about uh, sound barriers, mm -hmm. we encouraged them to, though they had telegraphed before that they, that they didn't find that that was a, um, a recommended action through the noise compatibility, we suggested that we asked them whether, if other funds or other programs came to be, uh, does anything in this plan preclude that from taking place? They said no, and we encouraged them to have some wording changes to be a little more clear that this funding source isn't recommended for that, but leave the door open for other things. Um, there were a handful of other little And that was that, not included? Well, th this was a feedback session, so. Okay. Um, this was the feedback that we provided them. I can share my other notes with um, counselors if you like. They were relatively small on those. So the I would be navigation um, agreement. None, none required know. except where except the FAA where they buy requires them. them. And in those cases, they uh, concurred with the recommendations of the city council that if the noise were to increase, that it nullifies the navigation easements. Oh, really? Oh, good. Yeah. Um, and <coughs> where they're not required by the FAA, that they would not be recommended at all to be done. So, yeah, no, it, was, it was positive. Mm -hmm. Was there any language, I can't remember whether we um, recommended the, the um, noise, noise monitoring. monitoring. I was going to get to that, too. Yeah. There was some discussion of noise monitoring, and I think that that was one of the pieces that, as feedback, that um, they, they had it included um, the flight tracking, and both we and Winooski had provided feedback that uh, perhaps the plan could include the possibility of noise monitoring, and uh, they seemed receptive to the idea, not necessarily prioritizing it in funding as to what's the top priority, but enabling it as, as a possible funding source, which is what the principal objective of this plan would be. So they seem receptive to that feedback. Good, because, yeah, we, we talk about what to do with um, fees that we collect off the fuel sales at the airport, and I saw you know, there's truly no way forward through the NCP process. I would really, I think it, it's something that lots of airports do and would be in our interest. Um, and I, con as you know, I contacted uh, the s school, the chair of the school board, but also David Young, the superintendent, because um, I think it's important for the school to, to you know, be protected in some way, and, and one of the ways of protecting it is to have data that we can use in order to state a case if we need to. 
uh, in the future. So. Good. Okay. Right, one last thing. Um, I have half of one thing. The Champlain Valley Conservation uh, Partnership, which is the group of oh, right. yes. communities, are hosting a Weed Warrior event no. coming up. This is the half I don't remember. One of the next weekends. At uh, Shelburne yes. Pond? Uh, yes. uh, it's, it's on the Ewing property. It's going to start on the Ewing property. Did they finish that sale, the purchase? Uh, I don't think it, everything is complete. But close, I think. Is it, Paul? Is the Ewing property transaction completed? Uh, there's two different parts of the Ewing property. The uh, transaction with the Nature Conservancy is complete, yeah. and that's been subsequently then turned over to UVM, as was the plan originally. The second part, this Vermont Land Trust, as far as I know, is still in the working through various parts of it. But the partnership now, I think, is South Burlington, Williston, Shelburne, Hinesburg, St. George. And so the communities are getting together to host a massive weed warrior oh, cool. event. And I'll get the date out to, to October 19th. October 19th. <coughs> yeah, I won't be here. No, a trained warrior. <coughs> and you are trained. <laughs> what time? That's all I got. Aye, aye, aye. Except to recognize Ashley um, for all of her work on, on, on really pulling the communities together and uh, setting this regional partnership up with her colleagues in the other community. So. Right. Okay. Um, number six, the consent agenda. I'd entertain a motion to approve the signed disbursements as presented. <coughs> Second. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 That passes. We'll move down to an update on the status of the consensus app pilot project, our new item seven. Okay. Dustin Plett, is that what it? Yeah, Plett. Yeah. Um, it's at 999 to 11. Thank you. The Weed Warrior. Mm -hmm. You go to the Shelburne Pond? Yes, and there should be. Uh, there are places. We'll if, get you're the information. Online, if you go online to our website, there's a map to show where to park. In a park at Bread and Butter Farm or, or thereabouts. Okay, take it away. Perfect. Okay, well, thanks for having me. It's, it was a beautiful drive down from Montreal. Uh, a rainy. <laughs> <laughs> did you come? Yeah, on Saturday. <laughs> when did you come? Today. Well, if you don't go back till tomorrow, it should be nice. It's supposed yes. to be sunny tomorrow. It's supposed to be? Yeah. Oh, I, I might yeah. stick around another day then. Yes. Uh, no, I, I love being down here. Uh, so just some quick updates. Here's some numbers for you that we, that we pulled, give you an idea of what's been going on the last four months. We can start here with some high level stuff and uh, I'll, I'll dig in a little bit more into the process, what's been happening behind the scenes to give you an idea of how product development and this pilot testing is going for us. Um, so here's when we launched, June 3rd, that was the official announcement we had in this room. Uh, Coralie's pushed out 21 individual polls since we've launched, um, individual votes that have been cast, getting close to 5,000. Participants, just over 1,000 total signups, verified people with, with IDs at 783, so getting close to 1,000. Initially when we kicked this off, we were thinking 400 to 500 would be a statistical significant number to reach, so we, we've surpassed that. Uh, as far as uh, split between uh, mobile devices of the citizens, uh, iOS or Apple is 69%, and the Android users are 31%. Uh, most of the issues we've been having uh, is coming from the Android side, but that's pretty typical uh, of product development. And then the most popular question has been about the uh, uh, indoor recreation facility. Uh, 563 people responded to that question. Uh, so that has been uh, the most interesting one so far. But very, very high level, that's how, that's how we're progressing. Uh, current tools right now, in case anybody isn't familiar with this, uh, this is what it consists of, the mobile application that we encourage the citizens to use. That's the new design. Uh, I, can, I can dig into that a little bit more if anybody wants to see what the newer designs look like. We can chat. Um, maybe tomorrow. Uh, it, it's a lot more interesting, it's a lot more engaging. Uh, the current tools uh, on the dashboard side on the right, or on the left side there, uh, that's another version that is rolled out uh, end of last week, early this week. It, it's starting to look more and more like a, 
an actual dashboard that somebody might be able to go to market with. So uh, it's been uh, it's been a busy summer of development. This is this is where we are. Uh, but to recap, how we got to here, this was the slide that I showed Kevin. I think December of 2018 when we were here, beginning of December. Uh, and if you look at where we are now, we're somewhere between project active and uh, and pilot review. Uh, we're not quite done yet, I'd say, where, where we wanted to get to with the pilot project. We're getting close, uh, and the pilot review is still a little ways away. I think, I think that the, the feedback that Coralie's been giving us has been substantial. It's been very, very informative. Uh, so her talks uh, with the League of Cities and Towns, uh, the, the, the feedback that came out of that from some of the other towns and how they might use a product like this has been very enlightening. Uh, it's, this, may, this may sound simple and uninteresting to some people, but to us, this is, this is fascinating. Uh, this, what's happening here, is fascinating. Um, and how we could accelerate this or make this more efficient is something we spend a lot of time thinking about. So being able to have access to somebody like Coralie uh, has, been, has been incredibly valuable for us. So there's things we haven't done yet. There's things we haven't built yet. There, there's pieces of the product that we want to push out. Uh, that we think will will add more value. So as far as ending the pilot, uh, we thought we'd be in a place about now where we would say, you know what, that's that's good enough. Let's, you know, let's let's regroup in a couple months and see how things look. Uh, I would love to keep going. There, there's there's no point in, in in stopping now. If you'll allow us to continue operating, I mean, we're making uh, or have made a fairly large investment in the development on our side. So if if there's no if there's no no objections. I'd like to keep this relationship going for a few months yet to see where we can get to. Um, so that's that's basically where we said we were going to be by now. We're pretty close within a few weeks. Uh, you know, last year when we talked to Kevin, uh, I think we've been making good progress and landed somewhere where we thought we would be about now. Uh, give you some update on what it's been like on the back end uh, without getting too technical. Building on top of the blockchain, as we originally intended, proved to be very, very difficult for us. Um, from the time we launched June, July, even into August, we were building an application directly on top of the blockchain. So that every action the person did or a user did on the application spoke directly to the blockchain. This was incredibly difficult technically to do. And me and Coralie had some conversations about this. Um, what we've done since then is we've put a middle layer between so that the application can talk to middle layer software and that updates the blockchain on a, on a rolling schedule. We don't need to get too technical. We can, you know, I can bring Oleg by and he can talk about this for hours if you want, if you want. Um, but that has allowed us to accelerate application development. So the first three months of the project was a lot of bug fixing. It was a lot of painful problem solving around how to build applications that speak to blockchain. Uh, we made the, the decision to change the architecture slightly, move in a slightly different direction. That has accelerated app development. As far as what the end user is seeing at the actual application level, the mobile and the desktop applications, there's been more development there in the last three weeks than there was in the first month because of the architecture changes we made in the beginning of September. So on the back end, there has been a lot of work happening. That shows up very seldomly on the, on the front end, given the type of things we were doing. There wasn't a lot changing. Uh, moving forward, the updates will come rather rapidly. So we, we've made some good progress as far as the pilot's purpose of testing some of the technology we wanted to test. It, it did exactly what we wanted to. It broke some things we didn't think it was going to break, and some things performed well. The secure voting performed well. So that piece of it, the actual the thing it was supposed to do, it did well, but working with that thing that works well is incredibly difficult. So that's where we are now. Um, as far as what we promised or what we said we were going to try and accomplish, uh, the blockchain, the data storage is there. Things that aren't there yet uh, is, is any type of computation that's happening. We're not doing any data fusion. We're not pulling any. Um, there's no modeling happening yet. There's no... Um, there's no data coming in other than what the users are providing. This is something we want to get to. Uh, realistically, now we're, you know, we're months, if not quarters, away from being able to bring those in. Just given how much work we need to do on the product front and to really make this valuable for cities and towns. So, just an update on where that was at. This was an, again another slide we presented um, earlier this year on what we hope to accomplish by the end of the by the end of the pilot, and that's that's where we are today. As far as future roadmap. Uh, looking ahead to this time next year, 
uh, on the product side, roll out the latest versions of the mobile and desktop applications. Uh, applications again, that's happening now. Uh, it's beginning to, uh, they're beginning to roll out in phases. Uh, there was a new uh, iOS and Android application that rolled out uh, on Friday and, and on Monday. The new desktop has some new features that makes planning the polls and planning the feedback uh, much easier. Um, just really quickly, um, we've added some layers to the program now. Now you create a project, you input what the project is, you create the timeline, and you nest the polls and the feedback within a project so that when somebody sees that poll, they can see the associated information around it. Very similar to what your project pages look like right now on the site. Um, something we didn't know even existed. Um, but we built something very similar on, on the platform. So now a user has a lot more context about what the actual poll is, which I think is something that was certainly missing from, from the first version. Um, so the, the two sides of that, uh, that's all part of this latest release. We want to begin on the business side this quarter. We want to begin commercial conversations with Vermont cities and towns. It would be great to bring them something and say, this is what we're working on. Is this of value to you? Um, ultimately, we want this to be a, a very much a for-profit business that evolves into something that is, that is adding value. Uh, we want it to be a, a SaaS platform, so a uh, software as a solution play. That's what this business is, is, is setting up to be. We imagine uh, a not too distant future being able to roll this out very rapidly into cities and towns in Vermont starting here and expanding out um, on a subscription model where uh, cities can essentially opt into consensus we work with them to onboard citizens and they're off to the races for that to happen a lot needs to happen on the product side but on the business side that's the that's the path we're marching down and there's a subs and there's a subsequent product line above that that has to match that step for step for that overall strategy to work um, the product doesn't really, the product roadmap, there's a lot to the product roadmap. There's a lot of individual lines to what we're building out on the product roadmap, but it, it's refining the tools so that engagement increases, you know, building the hooks so that people can share things they're interested about and, and bring people back to the application. Why does somebody come back to consensus every day? Is that a realistic request? Is it, re is it realistic to have somebody spend five minutes a day on consensus to understand something that's going on in the city? Uh, I like to think, you know, four to five minutes might be realistic. Maybe that's completely out to lunch, but you know, that's what we're imagining. If we can provide something that is, isn't engaging enough that somebody will spend five minutes to better understand um, a topic and then give feedback on that, I think we've, we've likely hit on something pretty powerful. Uh, so that's what the goal is. The, the, the app and the latest version of the app you'll see begin to build those, those user loops, those, those user feedback loops and ways to share stuff with their friends so that they, you know, build out the channels so people find consensus. Uh, that's, that's the plan for the product for the next 12 months, again, you know, increase engagement and build additional data input systems. That's, that's what product is going to be. Uh, on the business side, marching towards having uh, a business uh, that works, that's profitable, that, that makes money, that adds value to cities and towns. Uh, for the next 12 months, we're not going to be, we're not looking outside Vermont. This is, this is where we're going to build out from. So if we have some initial traction in the next three to six months, uh, there's definitely going to be uh, there's definitely going to be a consensus full-time presence in Vermont, in in South Burlington. I would love it to be in South Burlington. You've, you've done it's an unbelievable favor. I don't even think you understand how great this has been for us. Uh, so to have a presence here would be would be a real dream for us. Um, it's a lot of cost. It's a lot of overhead operationally to to, to set up another. Uh, to set up another office, but it's what we're aiming to do. If we can be there in the next three to six months, we would have, uh, it means it's working, and we'd be very, very happy with that. So that's where we're at. Any questions or comments? Oh, pretty clear. So I have to admit, I haven't gone on, I went on twice and then I haven't gone on again. Uh -oh. I feel like I need a reminder. Yeah, I was just, you, as so a notification, like, you know, there's an issue going around the city and there's some. Yeah, I haven't seen any well, reminders well, lately. It, I, I, I just don't. I did the other day because I was, I got a new phone and I'm looking at all my. Um, so we should check your notifications, Helen, because uh, as the stuff comes out, it'll send you a notification. So I get them, and it says, hey, a new question, and it lists what the question is, and when you click on it, it takes you right into consensus. But you have to set that up in that. your but notifications. What, what you're talking about... I signed up for notifications, and I didn't get them either. Yeah, what Not you're over talking the past an month and a half. Engagement loops, and we only pushed out 
uh, the the notifications like the like the, twice. the native the native built-in notifications that you can push out on on Google devices, Android devices, and and Apple devices within the last month or so. That's that that's a that was a that's a relatively, that's a relatively new thing. Yeah. You need a new version for that. The latest version we pushed out this week is the only version that will notify you that you need to update your version. Yes. So again, there's there's these there's these huge milestones happening behind the scenes that that I've been discussing with Coralie. When do we want to push effort into driving people to the application again? Probably within the next the next month or so, the next couple of weeks, we should do another push. Um, we, we spent uh, considerable ad money uh, pushing them there for this pilot project. Uh, I, I, we're of the belief that we need to get this application to a little bit better place before we spend that money again. Oh, okay. We need to build in those. We need to. We need to. We need to. We need to clean it up. Uh, it, it. It was great for the pilot. It tested a couple hypotheses. It allows us to test the, the back end, the technical side of it, to see if it was feasibly possible what we imagined. Um, but we need a better user experience. This is. This is not the the user experience uh, somebody would expect. Or, or demand from a from a product like this yet. So until until we get there, I don't want to spend the effort or the time or any goodwill driving people to this application yet. Okay, well, so. yeah, fair enough. But when you get it ready, I think part of it <laughs> should be reminders. I mean, right. as, uh, particularly if we are really looking for and interested in the response in a quick way, right. we got to let people know yes. the questions that we discussed are out there and we want your input so yeah some of these I didn't see and I yeah so I'll know now now I should get notices when there is are that, new questions a, have you updated it's an Apple consensus yeah, you should download the new version of the app I should download so okay I'll do that another time so, yes yeah, so <laughs> they were asking me those and questions that, I thought I'll have to do that another that, time <laughs> that new version will auto update if you have that setting auto update if not it will prompt you to update when you open it and there's a new update so again, I, I did do auto update. It just pushed out. It just barely pushed out. Oh, all right, all right. So try downloading again. So how will the notifications look when you have the new version? Like a standard. They uh, pop right up. Yeah, like native notifications. Just a band across the front. Mm -hmm. Just like any other notification. Yeah. Notification. Just branded consensus. Does the app have to be launched in the background in order to get the notification? Or if I did a force stop on it, would you still get the notification? Yeah. Uh, force stop. <laughs> I don't turn mine off, but I get the notification. I don't believe so. I don't believe you get the notification. If you do a force stop. Yeah, I'm not. If you, if you do a listing of all your apps and you and you kill them one by one, I don't know if it does a force stop or if it just removes them. Or you them cut from your phone off, right? Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know. So, I don't know sure, but I think it's a I'm just. I'm, I don't know how notif I don't know what has to remain in memory for notifications to work for an app. So I'm just curious about. How, you, yeah, uh, what seed of the app you have to have running in order to get that notification? That's a good question. It has a probably a pretty simple answer, but I don't know it. I'll Google it while I'm sitting here and get we'll back find to it. it. <laughs> right now. Okay. Anyway, I just downloaded it. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? So this pilot doesn't cost the city of South Burlington anything, and it's just your our time that we're expending on this, yes? That's right, yeah. I think it's great. I love the idea of this. For now. I love being a being But maybe a the goodwill in the this. future. Okay. Yeah. What about that? what about statewide? I mean, not not statewide, town by town, but the state as a whole. The state government would they be interested in something like this? Yes, absolutely. And and when we look at our our go to market <clears> plan, <throat> we imagine laddering up to the state. So when we, when we think about it, how does it make the most sense? If South Burlington. Uh, if, if onboarding South Burlington citizens then is, is the first step, then logically the next step would be, you know, Burlington, you know, the, the, the six or seven other major cities, uh, major cities and towns around this this area. Once we had them, then it's a logical next step to go talk to uh, the state senators, uh, the state representatives that represent those people within those cities because those people have already been onboarded into the application. It's one application. So then as they can communicate with those same people that you're communicating to with a different profile. And then as you move out from there, uh, you can begin to see a path towards onboarding a state. Um, but that's how we imagine. I can talk at length about that. Uh, that's something we talk a lot about. We eventually move into a, a statewide rollout. 
so, so imagine, Tim, you have your consensus app, so you might today have a question from South Burlington, but you might have one from one of the state senators, and you might have something from the state. Ultimately, if we have all of that on board, yeah. so you could be engaged at all levels. Yeah, or from V-Trans. Or if like they if wanted to utilize all it. All the users of 89 between exactly 13 and 16 between 6 and 9 a.m. Right. And vice versa, rush hour. V-Trans would push out a huge you know, survey saying, how many lanes would you like to lose today? <laughs> right. <laughs> but you couldn't answer as you were driving, because that would be illegal. <laughs> Hands free. So I do have a money question. Did we pay for the pilot program? No, OK. All right. No. No, we, we agreed to provide staff support and <clears throat> answer only things like letting people know on our website and all, but we did not pay anything for it. So how much time are you spending on this? Probably not as much as you guys ultimately would like, but um, Kevin and I talk uh, about what question needs to go out. I will tell you that the platform's super easy. I'm literally typing in the question, doing a couple of settings. It goes out. I monitor it. Um, I give feedback to, to Dustin as to what I'm hearing from people when they reach out. Um, so it's not a ton of time. Uh, I've done some thinking about how does it work. I presented consensus as part of a community engagement discussion when I was in Denver a few weeks ago. Um, and then at VLCT's town fair last week, in two sessions, I brought it forward to um, the other towns and cities that were there and so shared what we had been doing and why it would be a good tool to have in your toolkit to get to people because the old fashioned way of getting feedback. Uh, of everybody showing up in a room is not necessarily the best way these days, and we've got to use a bunch of different tools. So um, right. to, it, and it's if, minimal. It, it's minimal. It's minimal. Okay. Yeah. Good. We're grateful for every every moment. Every moment. <laughs> one, one of the one of the things that we did discuss is is the access control lists. How do you how do you layer the access to the data? If Coralie is ultimately the admin for the account, everybody here should be able to see the data as it comes in. Everybody should should be able to log in with their own credentials and see how the how the questions are being responded and how they're and how they're starting to add up. It doesn't make sense for only one person on city council to have uh, access to that information. So, yeah. Dustin, okay. how do you feel about where? How do you feel about the pilot program? Just in a in a word or two. Um, being on the business side, there has been moments of uh, absolute joy and absolute frustration. Um, <laughs> The, the technical <laughs> challenges, the technical challenges that we faced coming into July, and and what we realized in July and going into August were substantial. They they were significant, um, and we we worked uh, a lot of hours in, in what I felt like it wasn't well. We weren't moving forward on, on on that side because we were we were simply solving technical issues that had almost no impact on the actual pilot project that the citizens. Uh, we're seeing, which is fine. Some of those problems need to be solved. They had to be solved. Um, I was hoping there would be less technical and, and more issues, or we could push ahead and test more on the on the actual front end side, the actual the actual interfaces with the with the citizens and with the um, and with Coralie side on the dashboard. Um, ultimately, that's why I'd like to have more time, because some of those technical problems were more than we imagined. So it's been fantastic. It's been times where I've just been pulling my hair. It's been it's been it's been good. It's what we it's what we need to do. Well, you guys have been great to work with. So, well, that's great. Yeah, good. Okay, and no other questions. Thank you very much. Well, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. And we'll get another update in a couple months. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. That's what you're anticipating. Okay. Super. So we have five minutes before the next. Can we get through a couple committee assignments? Yeah. All right, so we have five minutes before yeah. the next item. So we're going to go on to committee assignments. Sure. Item 17, uh, I'll just say for GMT, you were pointing to me, Chair. Um, nothing really to report. We have our board meeting next week. Uh, we are looking at some, uh, a budget shortfall for both this year, so we are weighing about five different options, and uh, we'll be uh, giving some direction to staff at the next meeting to uh, shore up some of our shortfalls. Okay. Do you have? When yes. are the electric buses coming? We just got an update on that. They'll be they'll be here early November, but our charging stations might not be here until late November. So that's a requirement, you know. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We just put solar panels on top, they'll be okay. Yeah. Plug them into the wall. Uh, yeah. Really excited, early November. Great. Yes, um, we are really whittling down um, at our last meeting on uh, September 25th, I think. Um, we brought a list of 48 parcels down to 21 looking in the short term, which was we were our goal was the top 10 or 20. So we're within striking range. And um, that is going to be uh, worked on again uh, at the end of this month, um, I will be out of town on the 23rd as the next as the next meeting. Maybe it's October 1st was our last meeting, my husband's birthday. Um, and I also wanted to bring a question forward to this council um, because, as we look at uh, you know this consortium of towns looking at Shelburne Pond and how we can conserve it, we have a gem right here in South Burlington, <laughs> which is the Great Swamp, and I'm just curious what can we do more in order to really enhance its visibility, not necessarily to bring people there, because ideally it would be conserved as a natural area, um, but in terms of signage, in terms of educating the public and the development community, um, I think that this is a, a really important natural area that we have on our, on our maps but we don't talk about in the same way that we talk about Shelburne Pond or that we talk about Red Rocks, and it deserves that kind Where of status. Is it? I didn't even know we had a great swamp. It's in, that's, it's in the southeast quadrant. It's in the southeast quadrant. It is just east of um, South Village. It's between South Village and Dorset Park. That's right. Okay. Yes. East of South oh. It's just oh. north of the road that connects uh, South Village to Dorset Park. Oh, okay. So I, I just, I really want us to think about this. I'm not, of course, expecting action. And it's tonight. privately owned, I'm assuming. The land? It is, where is, he's not here. It's, it's incrementally being encroached upon. And, you know, I think that it needs, it needs some real attention. But you don't know why. I'm sorry? Multiple know. owners. Multiple owners? Um, I will ask Paul later. Yeah, yeah, when Paul gets back, yeah. Well, that's interesting, okay. Yeah. Great. Um, Tim, pension, have they we, met or anything? We had anything? a two-year meeting, but I was ill and couldn't attend. Oh, it was on okay. September 25th. Okay. Yeah. And Dave, you're not on any no. official committees? No, not right now. We haven't met. Okay. Well, good. Well, we've completed number 17. Excellent. Okay, yes. so let's go back to um, item eight and um, welcome Colonel David Smith from the Vermont Air National Guard. If you would come forward, please. Yeah? Uh, just wondering if we'll be able to ask Colonel Smith questions and get some answers to him. And if he's saying that he has to leave pretty soon after he speaks. Would it be possible to have those questions before he speaks so he can answer them in the course of his presentation? Well, how long are you planning to present? About two hours. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You're going to talk really fast, so it's in a half an hour? Probably, I don't know, 10. 10 or 15 minutes. 10 or 15 minutes. And so you could entertain questions from us and the public? Yeah, from you, if, through you would be great. Okay. Yeah, for sure. And the public, we have a number of people here who have, are eager to ask questions and raise concerns. Okay, well, let's see what sure. he has to say and what the council questions. We can always have another forum of sorts. So, Great. welcome. Thank you, Thank you for. Uh, well, thanks for the invitation to be here tonight. <clears throat> um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to thank the council for providing me this opportunity to update you on our ongoing F-35 mission. I'm Colonel David Smith, the commander of the 158th Fighter Wing, Vermont Air National Guard. I've been a member of the Vermont Air National Guard for over 31 years since growing up in the Northeast Kingdom and graduating from the University of Vermont. You invited me here tonight to provide an update on our F-35 operations, and I'm proud to do so. As an organization that is embedded in and gains its strength from the community where we are based, it's important that you have a familiarity with who we are 
and what our operations entail. As you know, since 1946, our airmen have been deeply rooted in our local communities and we have been a long-standing neighbor here in South Burlington. We take this partnership seriously and are committed to working together as we move forward. I know the F-35 has brought concerns to some in this community, and there are questions you have regarding our operations. I hope I can answer your questions and allay some of those concerns tonight. Through the Secretary of the Air Force strategic basing process, the 158th Fighter Wing was selected as the first Air National Guard unit in the country to receive the F-35 back in December 2013. Since that basing decision, the Airmen of the Wing have worked extremely hard preparing for the F-35 arrival for this very moment. This work has taken significant individual effort, teamwork, and support from families and from our communities. And as we've done for over 70 years, your Vermont Air National Guard performed extremely well, and the airmen of this wing were ready for the F-35 arrival on September 19th, and are ready to fully convert the 158th Fighter Wing to this new mission. Over the next nine months, we'll we will be receiving the remainder of our planes, a total of 20, when we're operating at full capacity. And during that time, we'll get back to the business of flying, which is what we do so well. I cannot thank our airmen, their families, and the community enough for their support. It's been incredible. And what I'd like to do is provide some specifics on where we are today, and I'll talk through a few topics. I'd like to start with our facilities. So we've had uh, around a dozen um, construction projects ongoing at the, over at the base for the last couple of years. Uh, and those projects total over $100 million. Four of those projects are um, fully complete. Uh, another couple will be complete in the next few months. And then we'll actually have construction ongoing until about November of 2020. And I think sometimes people think the base is going to be totally complete or was going to be totally complete by the time the airplanes get here. And that's, that's never been the plan, and that's not the plan. The facilities come online sort of in, um, um, in parallel with as the airplanes come, come online or come to, come to Vermont. It's also important that um, the vast majority of those, uh, certainly the subcontractors, were local, uh, local contractors. And I talked about the schedule has been prioritized. So our, our main operations building is complete. Our four bay full mission simulator is complete and fully functional. Our main maintenance hangar uh, is complete. Uh, and um, our taxiways and our parking apron is complete as well uh, with some other projects right behind. So that's quick on, on facilities. And about half of the $100 million uh, is specific to the F-35. And about half is what we would call current mission or was actually valid for the F-16 as well. So it's about 50-50 roughly on the breakdown of the cost there. Let me move to talking about our airmen, our, our greatest resource. Um, our wing is nearly 1,000 strong. So we have about 1,000 uh, members of the fighter wing. About 60% of those members are what we call traditional guardsmen. They're part-time. They work one weekend a month with us and, and uh, annual training sometimes during, throughout the course of the year. Excuse me, did you say 70%? About 60% about 60 of oh, 60%. those I'm are, 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 are part-time guardsmen. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, we roughly have about 400 full-time positions uh, total at the wing with different statuses. Um, about just over three years ago, 50, approximately 50 of those airmen went on active duty into the F-35 Enterprise. Um, to work on the F-35 at about a half a dozen bases across the country to gain that valuable experience that, that we need. Um, about two-thirds of those um, are back in Vermont uh, and assisting us as we train up the wing for the F-35. Uh, and those were mostly um, airmen from our maintenance uh, organization, some logisticians, uh, and then four pilots were part of that uh, sort of uh, three-year initial cadre as well. We currently have over 85 members at the fighter wing that are trained on the F-35, and we have right now what's, what's called a field training team, where that's where instructors come into Vermont that started a couple weeks ago, and it'll go all the way out through into December, uh, and that's almost 200 more of our airmen, primarily our traditional guardsmen, our part-time guardsmen who are taking part of that training right now. It's happening at the base right now. Uh, it's, it's multiple shifts per day, uh, and that's where we're gonna train the most of our, uh, our traditional guardsmen over the next couple months. 
We currently have eight pilots that are fully trained here in Vermont on the F-35, so they're fully qualified to fly the airplane. And we have another six that are in F-35 training right now. So we have a total of 14 of our pilots who are flying the airplane as we speak. And over the next roughly year, we'll have the remaining of our pilots um, get to training. Um, and as you, if you think about it, we can't have them all up front. So we, get, we have more pilots coming as we get more and more airplanes so we can uh, um, meet the flying schedule and, uh, for that regard. And then we end up with roughly 30 pilots. So we have about 30 pilots at the fighter wing out of the 1,000 members that we have. Let me talk about the F-35 arrival. Uh, I think you all know that uh, two weeks ago, the first two F-35s landed here in Burlington. And over the next nine months, we're going to get uh, 18 more. Uh, so on average, we'll see about two a month. Uh, it's not two every month. Some months it's three, some months it's zero. So it just depends. But over the next nine months, we'll get, on average, two a month. To be up to, by June of 2020, we'll have 20 airplanes on the base. And let me talk about, just for a second, and there's been a little bit of confusion about, hey, I thought it was 18 airplanes. How come it's 20? Um, let me just, hopefully I can clarify that. We're an 18 aircraft squadron, just like the F-16 was. Um, with an 18 aircraft squadron, you get some additional airplanes. The F-16 had, we had 23 F F-16s for a while. Um, but the F-35, we have 20. And what those two additional airplanes are, um, they're basically just a normal part of our normal maintenance procedures. With inspections and things, they just cycle into the normal flying schedule. So 20 airplanes doesn't drive our training requirements or anything. It's based on an 18 aircraft squadron. That's a really important note. So while we have 20 airplanes, it's all built about, um, um, around uh, 18, uh, 18 aircraft. I think that's, I want to make sure people are aware of that, of that piece of it. Um, let me talk about the flying schedule. Um, the flying schedule started last week. We flew what we called a one turn one, so we only have two airplanes. And one of those airplanes is being primarily used by maintenance for the training that I talked about earlier, so we're flying a one turn one. So we flew one airplane in the morning and one airplane in the afternoon. We did that four times last week. Um, this week we'll continue the same thing and eventually the way the flying schedule will work is as we get more airplanes, we'll slowly build out the flying schedule. So we'll start flying two airplanes at a time, then we'll start up flying four airplanes at a time, and then we'll get up and build out the schedule. So when we hit June of next summer, so June of 2020, when we have the full complement of airplanes on base, what you'll see is you'll see a flying schedule that's very reflective of what the F-16 was for 33 years. Um, you'll see very similar times, you'll see very similar numbers, um, it'll look very similar to what the F-16 was for three decades here in Vermont. Which is how many planes? We'll get up to what's called an eight turn six. We'll fly eight in the morning and six in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And that's what we did with the F-16. And so they all, they take off one after another? Is that nope. how it works now? Yeah, no. So what you would see, we fly, so, and people ask me, so fighter aircraft fly in pairs. So like two or four are like the fundamental foundation of, of flying, and that's for mutual support and just uh, executing our mission. So typically, your four ship, four airplanes, is sort of your baseline foundation. So you'll see typically two airplanes take off. If they take off, they don't take off together. So you, you may uh, know what a formation takeoff is. That's when you take off exactly together. We don't do that anymore. So typically what you'll see is you'll see one airplane take off, and then 15 to 20 seconds later, you'll see the second airplane take off. If there's four airplanes, you'll do, be the same spacing. So an airplane, 15 to 20 seconds later, another, 15 to 20 seconds later, another, 15 to 20 seconds later, the fourth. If we're flying eight airplanes, they would typically be split by in four ships. So four would take off, there'd be a delay, and then another four would go. Could be five minutes in between, it could be 30 minutes in between, really depends on what the mission is and what's going on that day uh, for that. And then the repeat with six planes in the afternoon. Typically, yes, that's correct. So four to six, so we fly four or six or eight, depending on the day and what the missions are, correct. And that's five days a week? Nope, it's four days a week. So we generally fly. Um, the base works what's called a 410 schedule. We Our, our main operating um, hours, if you will, are Tuesday to Friday, uh, although we do have um, people on base 24-7, and we do have uh, a footprint on base on Mondays as well, but our flying schedule is Tuesday to Friday. So you'll see morning Tuesday, afternoon Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And then what you'll also see is you'll see us flying on our training weekends. Our training weekend is typically the first weekend of the month. Um, non-holiday and, and typically we fly on Saturdays only um, occasionally we'll fly on Sundays and if we do fly on Sundays it's afternoon so we limit our takeoffs to no, uh, to, uh, no earlier than 8.30 uh, in the mornings and no earlier than noon on Sundays unless there's extenuating circumstances which doesn't happen that frequently um, we do have night flying requirements with the F-35 like we did with the F-16 when we do night fly we try and do that in this time of year 
or November, December, January, when the sun sets around 3.30 around here, it seems like. Um, so we try and do that to minimize the impact. So instead of taking off in the summertime at night when it's, you gotta take off at 9.30 or 10 o'clock, we really try and, and uh, drive our takeoffs to November, December, January, February, in, in, in the dead of the winter when it's dark earlier. When we do night fly, we put out media um, advisory to let everybody know we are night flying, so it's non-standard than our normal uh, operations. And we also put out media advisories if we're doing anything that's non-standard. Non Maybe there's some airplanes in town that we're training with. Uh, anything that's abnormal outside of our normal flying schedule, we'll put, um, we put out a media advisory to let the, the uh, inform the communities what's going on uh, for that piece of it as well. So those are a few topics that I wanted to talk about. Um, I also want to talk about, uh, um, I know there's some topics that have come up um, that I wanted to address. And let me talk about the nuclear mission. Um, we've said that before, and I just want to be really clear. We don't have a nuclear mission with the F-35. And we have no plan to have a nuclear mission with the F-35. When you look at the F-16, that airplane was nuclear capable and we flew that airplane for 33 years. We didn't have a nuclear mission with the F-16. So I just want to be really clear, we don't have a nuclear mission with the F-35 and there's no plan for one. I'd like to talk about afterburner use a little bit. I think there's a lot of concern about afterburner use. So we've flown, there's been four F-35s that took off out of Burlington on May 29th from Hill Air Force Base that were not planned. And we flew, let me see if I get it right, seven or eight lines last week. So there's been about a dozen F-35s that's taken off out of Burlington. 100% of those have been in what's called military power. That's non-afterburner. We do not plan to use afterburner at all in Burlington. The planning from the environmental impact statement was 95% military power. That's non-after, that's full power without afterburner. And 5% afterburner. Um, the 5% is just a, frankly, a catch-all. I mean, there may be a, an odd occasion where we would have to use afterburner, but we don't plan on it. When you look at the configurations that we'll be training in, the takeoff and landing data, which is critical to aviation, does not require it, and we don't plan to use it. So I, I just wanted to, to make sure. And what drives takeoff and landing data and what drives military power, it's, it's driven by regulations. And it's, it's actually pretty simple. If your takeoff distance in military power, so if your takeoff distance without afterburner is more than half of the runway length, then you're required to use afterburner. If it doesn't, you don't have to. Ours does not. So we don't plan to. And there's no configurations that we project in the majority of our flying that will require it. So I hope I can put people these. We do not plan to use afterburner. We haven't yet, and we don't plan to. And I really hope that the number is even less than 5%. Um, but um, we're tracking it, and we'll keep people informed of that. That's afterburner use. So like so, I said, So the pilots don't need um, practice nope. in taking off with afterburners? They don't. Why is that? It's. I mean, it just, it's it's really just your it's your it's it's your power setting. You either put the throttle here or you put the throttle here. If you put it in afterburner, you accelerate quicker and take off quicker. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, there's no specific training requirements. You know, takeoff power settings is a skill that you start learning from day one in pilot training. It's frankly, it's kind of like driving your car, whether you go full acceleration or you or not. So it's it's not a training requirement to track. So there's no requirement to train to afterburner. It's just a an inherent skill that we have as aviators, as pilots, and we use it if we need to, and we don't if we don't, and we don't plan to use it here. Just to follow up, because um, I believe that you do train for, um, you know, combat. We do. Right? And so when you are in a combat situation, you do not use afterburner? I really would depend on, this, on, the, um, on the environment. It depends on where the base is. It depends on what the runway length is. It depends on what your um, configuration is. Um, so it's, it, it depends. You might need it, but you might not. Um, and if you don't need it, you wouldn't use it. It really um, depends on the scenario. And because these planes cannot fly to the Middle East, for instance, without being refueled. Uh, so, you know, in theory, I'm speaking, um, we would not see the president send you from Vermont to, you know, Syria or anywhere else, that there would be um, some field that you land in. And there, um, I, I'm just, it seems just difficult for me to understand why there would not be a training in order for you to be ready for all of the various situations that might require afterburner takeoff once you are taking off in a combat situation overseas yeah there's there's not it's it, like i said i don't know how i can be any more clear it's, it's not a skill that's required to practice to you either use afterburner if you need it or you don't mm -hmm. and you're either going to hit your takeoff speed quicker or it'll take longer so there, there's not and if if the environment requires an afterburner takeoff we'll use it um, but if it doesn't, we won't. And there's there's no specific training requirements for it. What's really the don't. environment conditions? I mean, like I said earlier, it could be it could be the 
the base we're operating out of. Maybe it's a shorter runway length. Maybe it's a higher density altitude. Maybe it's um, the configuration of the airplane. Maybe it's, so it really, there's a number of factors. Um, maybe it's the proximity of where you are in, <laughs> In the environment, where is the base? How close is it to non-friendlies? Those kind of things. So it really, it, there's so many factors, but I can assure you um, that there is no training requirement for using an afterburner takeoff versus a mil power, military power takeoff. There isn't. It's just you use whatever is required by regulation. And so increased weight of the aircraft, though, could require afterburner takeoff, which is what occurred in 2008 with the F-16. It could, yeah. It, it increased air... But like I said earlier, there's no, our configurations that we'll be flying out of Burlington, there's no, we can't see any um, military power is going to be sufficient for how we're flying out of Burlington. Are the munitions when you carry munitions yes. as well? Okay. Yep. Yeah. Is there a way to tell when a jet takes off if you're using afterburners? It's louder. The airport, we could, in the, in the observation tower, could, is there? Um, if, depending on the, you could see it sometimes. If it's night, you'll definitely see the afterburner plume. Okay. You saw it with the F-16. Longer, brighter plume. Yeah. During the day, it's a little more difficult to see, but you can, depending on the environmental conditions. That's louder, so you'll be able to hear a difference, too. Um, just like with the F-16, you can see it, typically see the afterburner plume. Uh, correct. Tom? So on that question, um, I would just ask, uh, since it's you, you, when you take off is when you're, you, if afterburners are used, they're going to be used. Uh, I have many residents that have asked about sound walls, and I, I see sound walls along interstates. And it, I would just ask you, do you have any advice for how um, the South Burlington residents of that neighborhood, as well as this council, can advocate for dampening of sound noise on the ground? I know we can't stop the noise from up in the air, but do you have any thoughts or suggestions on sound walls, berms, and so on around the area? <laughs> yeah, and that question had come up from a South Burlington resident. Uh, directly to me and you know it's with my civil engineering team there's not a, you know and started out as jet blast deflectors which if you recall on the north part of uh, the taxiway there used to be a, a large one there and it was really for jet blast not for noise so that's where the conversation started and and we're real I'm not really sure on what the efficacy of a jet blast deflector is for noise you know as far as sound walls um, you know, there, there's not a lot of information from an Air Force perspective on the effectiveness of a sound wall. And, and I know the air, there's been some tests. Uh, so I don't have a lot of data on, and, you know, and if you look at one of the challenges from a base perspective is, is where you could put them. Because, you know, not only do we have um, our taxiways and our parking apron designed for the F-35, but it's also designed for other airplanes to be able to come in with larger wingspans. So, you know, it's not like you can just position a sound wall or a jet blast deflector right next to the parking ramp because it'll be in the way of, of a larger aircraft that may come in to pick up people or equipment. So it's tricky uh, how, you know, how effective something like that would be. Uh, I don't have a lot of, um, great information to your for your question there i know they can be effective uh, i'm not sure how effective they would be in, in our circumstance uh, i really don't so uh, none of the military bases probably have them because they're usually out in the middle of nowhere um i've never i don't recall ever don't seeing I, i've been at a lot of military bases in my 31 career 31 year career and around the world i, I don't ever recall seeing um um, sound walls. I've seen jet blast deflectors, which is just that to deflect blast, so it doesn't you know knock things over, or if there's other airplanes nearby. Um, but to your point, it's not true that that bases are just in non-populated areas anymore. So I think you said that they're all in ice. They're they're not. Um, if you look at guard units, they're all in. Most all those are in cities. If you look at some of the big military bases, they're in large residential areas now. The population is is different. So. Um, but no, I've never seen any at a uh, that I can recall a specific like sound walls, mm -hmm. um, and I honestly don't really know, frankly, what they would look like. I've seen some natural sort of screen and walls for sound, but um, and I've seen jet blast deflectors, which do just that. And, and, and I don't think a jet blast deflector is really that effective. And from what I've seen or read briefly, that they're designed for that. Yeah. Do you have another question? I do. Yeah. Thank you. Um, is this uh, a plane that will serve our national defense or offense? Both. Can you explain how it will serve our defense? Sure, it, it can serve our defense just like, um, you know, from Homeland Security, just like the F-16 did. Um, it can defend this country um, like any other fighter has or and, and probably better. Uh, so sure, it absolutely can defend the homeland. Okay. And I'm not sure what your question is. We would, if, if need be, we'd base it right here and defend the homeland. Okay. 
Absolutely. Well, it, usually this kind of aircraft is for offensive missions. And so the question I had, um, since with the F-16s you also would go abroad and you would flight, you would fly, of course, abroad and serve in, in various um, arenas abroad. Uh, would there ever be a situation where you could, when you say you, you don't have a nuclear mission, when you are based abroad that you would in fact carry these small tactical nuclear weapons? I mean, that's a hypothetical question. Not that I can foresee, but I mean, I can't predict the future. Um, so no, I mean, I, but no, so, there, we, but we don't have, I, let me just be clear, we don't have a nuclear mission, so we're not given uh, a mission that we don't have. So we don't have a nuclear mission. It's just like with the F-16, we had specific missions. We weren't given other missions, we did our mission. So right. we, don't have an F, we don't have a nuclear mission with the F-35, and so I, I wouldn't expect that we would have a nuclear mission um, because we don't have that mission. Even and then when back to your- Overseas, when you, are, when you are in a situation- Yeah, when we go overseas, we execute the mission that we train for. That's what we do. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're all about readiness and being ready to execute our federal mission. And we train to the mission sets that are given to us by design in our operational capability statements. This is like, we are, it's laid right out for us. You have to be proficient and ready on these specific things, and the nuclear mission is not one of them. So we wouldn't be given a nuclear mission, you know, if we, we don't train to it. So it's like we would expect with the F-16. And like to back up a little bit, when you think about defense of this defense of the homeland, that's a top priority for the national defense. And when you look at F-16s, so currently today, F-16s defend the homeland, F-22s defend the homeland, F-15s defend the homeland, and the F-35 can defend the homeland just like they did. And we can also the F-35 is also very capable offensively as well. So both both offense and defense. How can it protect us against land-based ballistic missiles? I mean, those are the things that could reach us. I don't think that jets similar to the F-35s could reach us from one of our yeah. enemy countries. I, mean, I don't want to get into yeah, that. Yeah, I can't get into that. I'm not going to get into right. classified right. information, obviously, but right. I will just say the F-35 is extremely capable. It's a very capable airplane. We have 14 of our pilots flying it, some for over three years. It's really, really capable. It's really good. It's really good at what it's designed to do. I was I was just looking through the, um, um, the administrative record. There's a group of citizens here. Can I finish here. my statement or, oh, or not? Oh, of course, sure. Um, so the after, so EIS, so the environmental impact statement. Um, I wanted to address a couple things there. We've received some emails uh, demanding that we do a uh, supplemental EIS, and, and what I read was that was based on the afterburner use. And I just want to be clear: there's no requirement for us to do a supplemental EIS because nothing has changed from the initial environmental impact statement. I talked about afterburner use earlier, and there's nothing that's driving us to do a supplemental EIS uh, on that piece of it. I also want to let it, you know, we continue to work with the airport. We've been a part of the Part 150, the airport noise, airport noise compatibility program for years, and we will continue to do so. There'll be another noise study when we have our full complement of airplanes. Um, that's outlined and required of us. We'll do that. I want everyone to know we're operating, so we've been operating the F-35 here now for a week. I mean, we've, you know, not much yet, but for a week, and we're operating consistent with the EIS. So when you look at how that was laid out, we're operating consistent with that document. And it's also important to know that the EIS branches out into what's called a mitigation and management plan, and the record of decisions in there. Um, we have specific requirements that we're, that we're responsible to track, and we are. We'll track afterburner use, we'll track number of operations. And then we'll validate that the EIS was, that the assumptions that went into the EIS were valid. And that started and that'll be ongoing. It's going to be an ongoing uh, process uh, for that. Um, and I'd just like to, to end, to close um, by saying, um, I just want to thank you for this opportunity to provide an update on our current operations. The F-35 is here and we've begun getting back to the mission we do so well, and that's flying and maintaining airplanes. And I can assure you, that we take our responsibility seriously, that we'll safely and professionally fly the F-35 like we did the F-16 for 33 years and the F-4 behind, before that, and that we're committed to diligently working to minimize and mitigate our impact to our communities. I'm proud to represent the men and women of our fighter wing and so proud of the work they are doing both at the base and close to home in our communities. So thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? If I could just follow up, uh, sure. yes, a um, group of citizens requested through a Freedom of Information Act um, uh, an administrative record of emails that went back and forth, <coughs> even 
uh, Lieutenant Colonel Caputo uh, appears in this administrative record, but I'm, I'm looking specifically, and I won't go through all of them, but with regard to the use of afterburners, not use of afterburners, I see here on November 4th, 2013, uh, there are two Air Force personnel who are, are discussing, and one of them- Who are they? Um, what are their names? Baradell is writing to Penland. I don't, I don't know who they are, okay. okay. So Baradell writes, afterburner takeoffs are a safety of flight concern and the norm for even twin engine fighters. A quicker axis, less runway used for takeoff and therefore more length to abort or pull back down on the runway. Bottom line, the acceleration and additional options afforded a single engine aircraft drive the takeoff, which we have a single engine aircraft with the F-35. Am I right on that? Yep, yes. you're right. So um, the acceleration additional options afforded a single engine aircraft drive the takeoff to the more appropriate afterburner go, and that is what is being executed by the services currently at Eglin, and Eglin does have a longer runway than our runway. I believe that our runway is the shortest runway of all those that were considered. So I, I'm just, I would like to hear your response to. What's the question? Well, the question is, is please respond to the, these Air Force. Um, what's, what's that um, man or woman's qualifications, that, that email? What's their background? Uh, <laughs> that I don't have, but they come from the Pentagon, I believe, all right? And so I think they're pretty, um, pretty expert on, on the situation. And what they were saying, um, there's, it, there are various things, uh, talking about how uh, Lieutenant Colonel Caputo um, was um, kind of gaming the system. Is here another, uh, this is Germanos, who we met uh, back in 2010, no, yep. yes. No. Um, he wrote, um, developing the procedures now, which is what, sh um, what you've done, and then not implementing them until the F-30 arrives is gaming the system. And so there's some, there was uh, a lot of concern um, that, the um, use of the, the modeling uh, software that was chosen, the Carnes 3 versus the Carnes 2, that I, I don't need to go into detail, but I would like you to respond to these concerns, um, Germanos, you know, saying that there was a gaming of the system and that, in fact, um, the afterburner use would be required given the length of our runway. Yeah, um, afterburner use is not required. Um, based on the length of our runway, and, and we've had 100% of our takeoffs not using afterburner. So that's the fact. With respect to gaming the system, that's just simply not true. I mean, you know, when you look at the preparations that go into base, you know, the environmental impact statement and the basing decision, it's really important that the assumptions are as accurately um, determined um, to reflect the um, location that the airplane's going to be flying at. And that's what was done. And I think if you look at it, uh, it was valid. Um, we're not using afterburner here. There's no requirement to do so. And, you know, you, you, can't, um, you can't compare an F-35 to an F-16. It's a different airplane. And you can't compare Burlington, Vermont to Eglin Air Force Base or Hill Air Force Base or Nellis Air Force Base or Luke Air Force Base, or Edwards Air Force Base that are flying F-35s, it's apples and oranges. You know, there may be different procedures for those bases based on a number of different conditions, whether it's density altitude. Maybe that base wants to use afterburner for their, no for, for their noise mitigation. Maybe there's less people, uh, there's a number of things. So it's, it's not a fair assumption, um, I don't think, for people at the Pentagon, and I don't even know what their you know, expertise is. I don't know if that individual is a rated officer that's even flown an airplane that's ever used afterburner. But you or, knew Nick Germanos. So I knew the name. I've never met him, but I know he was involved. In, in, so we didn't game the system. We, we, we as best we could, accurately um, determined as best we could, you know, almost 10 years ago to start, um, that it was reflective of how we were going to operate the airplane here. And as we just shown, it is. I mean, we're, using, we're not using afterburner. I, Even I don't though, know how else to, yeah. um, you should be happy about that. I mean, it's. You, I am. I just want to see it, to believe it. There's another yeah, you, you, email. Come to the airport. You can yeah. see it. Engelman I mean. to Nelson, and he was, he's saying, well, he's saying with munitions, though, um, that it's not the standard way we fly. 
and using military power when we take off with musicians. That kind of change, um, it says, assuming the plane can depart with munitions at less than military power, that kind of change will not decrease the total size of the noise contour, but it may shift noise somewhere else. Um, any other changes mean we are just shifting the noise one place to another. Um, so I, I just, I just raise these things because I, uh, that's my job, right? right and no. so I wanted to have I, you respond to that. Um, I, I mean, I, I'm trying to make, I mean, we're not planning to use afterburner and you can watch the airplanes take off and we're not. And when you look at the training that we're gonna be operating, that we're gonna be conducting here um, with the configurations, it doesn't require it. Very, very rarely would we need to use afterburner and we don't plan to. Other bases may not need to and do, just based on their conditions. It's That's their decision. But our decision is we're not going to use it, and it's not required. The regulation doesn't demand it, doesn't require it, and we don't plan to. So um, the assumptions were valid, and we've already um, validated them. I have two other questions, but I'm willing to I'll ask one in between. Um, in terms of uh, the hours that you fly, yeah. is there any flexibility to work with uh, Chamberlain School to um, select times in the morning and the afternoon where it might work better for their educational programming? Such as? Well, I mean, I don't know what their programming is. If they knew that the planes were always going to take off, you know, during recess time, because it's recesses at 10, let's say, then perhaps um, that could drive when you take off, so you don't have flyovers when all the kids are outside at recess. They're inside, you know. Yeah, well, I mean, is that you know, a possibility, or is it just you get your orders and, gall darn it, we're going to take off at 9:15 because that's what we're told to do? No, we've worked with the community for years, and when you look at, you know, to, to frankly, to fit two flying periods into a day, there's only so much that you can slip mm -hmm. or, or slide. Um, we don't want to take off too early. Um, just because we don't want to, you know, wait, people are sleeping. So, I mean, it's, um, it, it really depends what they're asking. You know, we're, our, our takeoff times are by design so we can get two flying periods in in a day, you know, in a normal day. So, um, you could certainly see what they're asking for. I'm not sure what they're asking for. Sure, I, and I don't uh, know what they need either, but maybe that would be some good consensus questions in terms of, you know, potentially the neighborhood wouldn't mind a 7.30 a.m. takeoff because most people are up and getting ready yeah, for that's, work. That's not, that, I mean, that's. Oh, that can't happen. Yeah, I mean, that's a little early to, you know, okay. yeah. That's, we're, we're, we're not going to plan, we're not going to be taken off at 7.30 in the mornings. Okay. That's a little, I don't think, that may be great for Chamberlain School. I don't think it's great for um, some of the other parts of the community. I don't know. It seems pretty early to me, but I mean. Well, I don't if you know. Have I mean, that could have, be a question have, we ask. What, yeah, what's, I mean, your, if, if what's your poison? You know, pick your poison. When do you want to hear this stuff? When do you want your lives um, interrupted by it, even though it's a short period of time? Yeah, we uh, work. Just, we work closely with the I airport on the noise committee there, and um, that's an active group. And and um, I haven't heard that come up, but. Um, Huh. I was just going to ask, do you ever allow school children to come out to the base and check out the planes and go we in do. the plane? That'd be great. Yeah. All right. It's trickier with the F-35, honestly, um, than the F-16, just based on the um, technology and, and the sensitivity. Uh, but yeah, we do. Uh, we, and we love it. Uh, we love doing too. tours. Uh -huh. yep, counselors do. too? We do. All right. Yep. Um, we do a lot of them. There's a lot of interest in, in what we do. And uh, and I encourage, uh, I encourage you all to come out uh, and see... Um, not only flying, we have almost 100 career fields on the base. So, yeah, we've, our, we're a flying wing, um, but we have tremendous opportunity and tremendous um, work being done by a lot of really talented, uh, really professional men and women. Megan, yeah. you have two more? Yeah, I know that we, our question whether or not we could alert the schools, and just, not just Chamberlain, but there are many preschools also in the area and home care um, that is provided in the, in the neighborhoods. Um, and I was 
following up on a suggestion that uh, I received in a discussion, so I don't take credit for it, but if we can't know the exact time of takeoffs, could we have a three hour window or three hours ahead of time? Could you alert the superintendent or the principal of the school, trusted people who, of course, you know, do not have a direct line to any of our enemies, but people who would say, we need to get the kids inside right now, especially if you, you know, you're saying we want to hold back on using afterburner as much as possible. There might be times when you say we're going to have to use afterburner today. Could you give people just three hours notice, we're going to use afterburner today? Something to, because these children's ears are very delicate. I know from my own experience with my own daughter with the F-16s, we got caught under the flight path and she melted onto the ground. I mean, she was in agony. I just, these are little, little people with little ear canals. And I, I think that if there is some way to maintain security, but protect the most vulnerable members of our community, I, I would really like us to explore that. So just following up. On yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what I've seen some other um, thoughts on sirens and, um, um, you know, and, and, and publishing schedules. And, and the thing about publishing schedules is one, the, you mentioned the operational security piece we take really seriously, but also things change too, right? I mean, we may have a, a takeoff schedule for this time and we slip it an hour because the people we were flying with had weather or there's weather in the airspace or so you'd be constantly um, having to try and, you know, update people, hey, we're not going to take off at 10, it's going to be 11. Um, certainly if, like I said earlier, if there's a time where we're, or we predict um, or we're expecting something that's abnormal, whether that's after, you know, uh, like we're planning on more airplanes for an exercise or something, we let people know, so we do that. Um, but all I'll say is if, you know, you're going to see our takeoff times are really consistent. If you look out, if you watch, they're going to be pretty close every day. Um, and from a community perspective, they're going to be like the F-16, where I think people will get to know when our takeoff times are, and they're really consistent, and we'll let people know when we night fly, and that'll be a, a shift in takeoff time. But I, I'm not sure what the, um, the method would be to inform of, of uh you or know, direction specific. you fly, because what caught us off guard? In well, fact, the direction right? is—it's it, not our choice. Right. So the direction is just is strictly driven by what the winds are. You right. Always, you know, you always take off with a headwind. So we take off on the active runway. Well, whatever the airlines are landing on, that's where we take off. Only you know, if there's, unless there's something odd, but you just—it's wherever the windsock is, and, and tower controls that right. um, the takeoff direction. So we. I, I know you normally take off northwest towards Winooski. It's but actually this about fifty-fifty. Is it fifty-fifty? It is. It's okay. actually about fifty-fifty if you look at the numbers over time because it was in williston where we were so it was an unusual thing to have yeah no i mean it really is there. about 50 50 whether we take off on runway 15 or runway 33 to the north it's it's about a 50 50 mix the, this last question i have okay. uh, is you talking about um you know the dollars and i just wanted to to note that it's over 60 million dollars to insulate um homes over 2,600 homes potentially against noise that the FAA says cannot be mitigated. Um, so I just looking at cost benefit and also the loss of homes for our workforce. This is a very, um, economics can be debated in, in other words. But the big question I have here is with regard to mechanics. Um, are all uh, repairs going to be done by our VTANG mechanics, or is there going to be um, outsourcing to Lockheed Martin or some other? Um yeah, just just like the F-16 was and other fighters are, uh, the majority of the work on our airplane is our mechanics. We, we you know we are when you look at how the maintenance organization changed. Um, there were some career fields that went away and some new ones that came in. So. You know, flying um, the F-35 out of Burlington is, in a lot of ways, not unlike what we did with the F-16. There's a pilot still in the cockpit, and there's a maintenance professional with a wrench turning air, you know, fixing the airplane and, and launching and recovering the airplane. Certainly some um, inspections and, and maintenance, there's what's called depot level maintenance, which is out in different places. The F-16s used to go out to Hill Air Force Base in Utah occasionally for depot level maintenance. Our maintenance professionals didn't do that, but someone else did. So it's similar with the F-35. Our, our maintenance team will maintain the airplane, but there are some things that it will go off to uh, more depot level 
and, and component repairs just like the F-16 was. So it's very similar. Yep. Yeah, we still have, our maintenance group is essentially the same size. It's a little bit smaller, but overall the wing is the same size and maintenance modified a little bit with, with new career fields, but it's, just, we have crew chiefs on the flight line launching and recovering airplanes and specialists and um, fixing the airplane, just like the F-16. So that's not true and it's been a, that none, there's no maintenance happened, that's simply not true. It's very similar to what the F-16 was. No airplane has all their maintenance, it, it, stuff goes you know, to different locations. Can we um, open it up to a couple questions? I don't want statements. I want, if there's a question that hasn't been asked or pursued um, from the audience, would you be willing to field a few? Yeah, if they, if they want to okay. ask you the question, then I'll see if I could. Okay, um, the gal over there, yeah. question about afterburn and a comparison between Hill Air Force Base and Vermont. Yes, can you just identify yourself, oh, please? Sure. Chelsea Clark. And uh, just wondering um, what the comparison is between why Hill Air Force Base has to fly with afterburner and why Vermont doesn't. Is that something you can answer? I mean, it's like or use this afterburner? Yeah, I mean, it's like I said before. I mean, it, it really depends on the airfield. Hill Air Force Base has a really high density altitude. So... Yeah, it's a mile high, and that makes a huge difference. When you look at factors that drive an afterburner takeoff, temperature is one of them, density altitude, and it all kind of plays into your, your pressure altitude, but your density altitude, whether you're at Colorado or Salt Lake City. Um, so I would say, you know, I've never flown uh, out of the F-35. I've flown an F-16 out of Hill Air Force Base. Um, and I would say to, to, the, to the question, it's really, it's probably driven by their takeoff and landing data based on the density altitude. Um, but bases can be always a little different. How they operate, um, it's it's not it's not apples and apples. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. So I'm please identify yourself. My name is Loretta Merrill. Oh, hi. hi. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Thank you for your messages. Yeah. I would like to shake hands. Is that okay? Sure. Okay. Okay. Nice to meet you. Yeah. So. Um, if I'm correct, you're saying that um, a noise wall is not going to happen. What can you suggest for mitigating ground noise? Um, I've been told, and it seems to me to be true, that the warm-up period is somewhere like 20 to 30 minutes. It is. You, you know, by the time we start and take off, it's about you know it's 20 to 30 minutes. What can be done? Um, you know, we looked at, I mean, sound walls, you know, my, my team looked at and there's just not a lot of information in the Air Force. And like I said, earlier, like how you would actually put, you know, how effective is it? And then how would you actually get something like that on an installation where you have other requirements to for bigger wingspans and those kind of things. So, um, you know, we we work to minimize our, you know, ground time. And, you know, there's a, there's a, there is a, a specific amount of time it just takes to get started and get all your checks done and take off. Um, you know, one of the things that's different with this airplane um, that I think will help is uh, with the F-16 we would start uh, either in, the, in our um, flow through parking spots in front of the, if you've seen those, the ones that say you mount, you stick your mountain boys on, we would start there and then taxi out and we would taxi to one end of the runway um, and we'd wait down there um, and that's called an end of, end of runway. The F-35 is different, doesn't need that. So we really, we're going to use that much less. So we'll use that some but not, not as much. So right there the sound would be more confined to the base and not on the ends, which may be closer to pop, potentially closer to populated areas if you look at the north end. Uh, yeah, so that may help a little bit, but uh, I don't have a great solution on ground noise. And I know the airport would have the same thing. I gotta believe that it's probably louder in the South Burlington communities on the airport side, just for the airline traffic that's starting over there versus an F-35 that's a mile away operating on the other side. I don't, I'd have to, I don't know what the sound measure would show, but I think it's, it's gotta be, it would have to be like a collective airport I, th I think you'd probably have more um, ground noise from your, you know, Delta and American airplanes running in, you know, the more that kind of thing. So uh, I don't know, I have a great, we haven't found a great solution on an Air Force side. Uh, and I've never, <coughs> I've never seen any in my experience. So, yeah. okay. well, if something comes up, yeah. let us know. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the gal way in the back. Hi, my name is Ann Boring, and I have two questions. I have a lot of questions about this, but two. 
One is around the flight schedule. You said you've been flying the same flight schedule for 33 years. And I can remember, I live in, I work in Wednesday and live on the flight path. And I know that there haven't been eight sorties every morning and four to six every afternoon for the last 33 years. The last four or five years, you've been ramping up for that. So that's one question. How, how can you say you've been doing the same flight schedule for 33 years? And second of all, at one point during the process, somebody in the car said, because there's going to be fewer planes, there's actually going to be fewer sorties. And now there's part of, um, so why, why did somebody say that? And now we're actually going to see more sorties than we did with the F-16s. So that's my first question. Yeah, no, I think to your point, I, when I was talking about schedule, I was referring more to just like the times of day, kind of the schedule. But when you look at what will fly with the F-35, it is reflective of what we flew in the F-16. For and, the last four or well, five years, for not the for the last 33 years. Because it was like Tuesday mornings. Yeah, and I didn't say, flights, uh, like I said, I was I was referring to the schedule. I mean, more, I've flown here, I flew the F-16 for 25 years. Mm -hmm. And we took off in the morning and we took off in the afternoon for 25 years. That's what I was referring to. When we had the alert mission, we did, we flew some fewer local sorties and we also had an alert attachment. So collectively, that was a long time ago. So, we, we flew an 8 turn 6 with the F-16 for a number of years, um, and that's what we'll fly with the F-35. So well, what about the one statement that somebody from the Air Guard did say you were, there would be fewer sorties? Yeah, well, I, I'm not sure that they say fewer sorties. If you look at the environmental impact statement, it actually refers to operate the number of operations. The number of operations from the F-35 went down from a little over 8,000 in the F-16 to about just shy of 5,500 in the F-35. So. An, an opera, so a sortie is a flight. An operation is a takeoff and a landing or an approach. So you add them all up. So a takeoff is one operation, a landing is one operation. And typically we take off and we land. So typically we get two operations per sortie. Occasionally we'll do what's called a low approach where for a training requirement we'll have to do a pattern. And that's an operation as well. So when we looked at it, the number of operations, not sorties, but operations for the F-35 has come down from the F-16. So I'm not sure who said that, but maybe they were confused on sorties and operations because there's a difference. It's not a, uh, operations are not a sortie. And an, and an operation is not necessarily two times a sortie. It's actually two and then occasionally we'll do a low approach. And it'll, and, and it, but so it's So why less. are there fewer? I don't understand why you're gonna have fewer with the same number of flights and stuff like that. So yeah, because we, we do deliberately things. work to not do low approaches here in Burlington. We use our out, you know, our, we were, what's called TDY, we're on temporary duty occasionally so for you know, a number of weeks during the year where we're not flying here. Um, we really strive to do a lot of our training requirements at Wheeler Sack Army Airfield over in New York State, because that's right near one of our training areas. We do approach the platform from time to time. So we really try and minimize uh, and truly um, make that gear. So when you look at, to my point earlier, you know, when you look at um, the EIS, it wasn't about gaming the system. It was about accurately projecting and defining what the assumptions are for the EIS. And it's our responsibility to validate that moving forward and we will already track in. Mm -hmm. And so it must be because you want to be a good neighbor, um, that's about that with you because there's a lot of concerns about a uh, supplemental or new AIS with the air guard consider doing that just in response and that's just to the neighborhood and the communities that are affected. There's no I mean if, if a supplemental EIS is required we'll do one. But, but there's no reason as a, well, as a for what reason? I mean, I guess just, it could be because the, there's, there's uh, no like reason there's, to do it. Okay, let's not let, let's not get into yeah, an argument, a please. No, I, mean, uh, I understand that, but we have two oh, people, but three people good, speaking. I mean, there is no requirement to do one. If there is, we'll do one. And the, my point was the assumptions that went into the initial EIS are valid. And we're already validating them, and that's our job, and, and we're held accountable to that, and we will. If it drives a supplemental EIS, we will do one, but nothing drives one. So just to do one, because there's, it, it's not required um, to but do. People okay, I, thank you. Um, one last question. Yes. Please state your name. I had you. And I was in your class. I was in your class. You were? I was. <laughs> he had longer hair then, I bet. I, actually, I didn't. Oh, you did. Many airports do real time uh, noise monitoring at various points. And 
we are mostly here talking not about the peak noise, but the average noise. Right. And I wonder if the National Guard does real-time noise monitoring on the Burlington Airport. We don't. Okay. No, neither does the airport. Okay. The no. only the only actual noise monitoring that I've ever experienced is the Chamberlain School. I mean, South Burlington School District did a noise study at Chamberlain where they actually physically measured noise. They measured it in the classroom. They measured it out on in the playground. Um, and what they found was it was very reflective of the EIS. So when you looked at that noise study, and I went to the to the presentation to this to this to, uh, school board, and then compared that with the EIS, that's based on modeling. It, it was very accurate, very reflective, and and so it, to me, it, it the modeling is really accurate. But to your point, no, we don't, and there's no requirement to. One more question. One quick one. Okay. That one was quick. Um, um, that was that was trying to be quick. Um, what would happen if an F-35 crashed off the airport um, grounds? Um, what kind of agreements do you have with the <coughs> fire departments, with the uh, emergency services? In other words, who would come if there was an F-35 crash and fire? Yeah, well, we have, um, we do a lot of, we have a lot of mutual aid agreements with the community. I mean, I think you know our fire department serves the airport, so our, our fire department would respond, but also the local first responders would respond, and we actually train, we have ongoing training that occurs with them. So, um, like any, any airplane, whether it was a F-35 that crashed or a civilian airplane that crashed, the local responders would respond. If it's an F-35, we would as well, uh, and, and most likely on a, um, based on our mutual aid, uh, our team, our fire department, um, which we pay for, the military pays for, would respond most likely to a civilian just based on our mutual aid agreement. So we would all respond. And, and there is training. local fire departments, it sounded like they weren't prepared to deal with the toxic fires that would happen if an F-35 well, crashed and burned. With any airplane. I mean, any any civilian airplane or have composite material. So it's not specific to an F-35. I mean, any... Any civilian airplane that flies now has a tremendous amount of composite material. So it's, I think any, you know, all I can say is our team trains with our local first responders. They have for years and they have with the F-35 as well. And they're fully, our, our team is fully qualified to do so. And we appreciate when you respond in South Burlington. Yeah. Yeah. First response here in South Burlington. An hour. Well, I want to thank you very much, um, Colonel Smith, for your time and your willingness to take um, sure. some questions. And I know this can always seem a little um, uncomfortable, but I think you know people are interested and want information, and I appreciate yeah. your willingness to share what you have. No, I think I, I appreciate the invitation. I really do. And it, yeah, it can be a little, uh, but it's really important that as neighbors that you understand what we do uh, and what our operation is and it's our responsibility to, to give you the most information we can and, and we will and, and and i would envision this in the future uh, just another update on how we're doing how things are going and i said we're tracking afterburner use we're tracking our operations and um it's our responsibility and and, and i look forward to doing this in the future again okay thank you thanks very much. thank you very thank much you. okay item nine i sorry we are a little late but so item nine, um, we may want to have a deliberative, a brief deliberative, private deliberative session uh, oh, okay. off in another room uh, for item nine. Item yeah, 10 is, is ready to go. But uh, Paul has some additional information about item nine. So we might want to go someplace else to do that. Okay. So deliberative motion to make? So do we, we make a motion to go into deliberative session? Uh, not required, but if you'd like to for Sue's minutes, it might be easier. Okay, I would appreciate a motion to go into a deliberative uh, session to discuss interim zoning application IZ 19-03. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 So I would like to call back into order the South Burlington City Council meeting of Monday, October 7th, 2019. And um, we have in deliberative session, the council agreed to um, approve the application um, IZ 19-03 and IZ 19-04. 
unanimously. So those are approved. And what I would also like to um, point out or, or note that um, regarding the um, IZ 19-03, which is the Spear Street Road development, the um, council received um, a letter from an abutter with new information, but we closed the meeting or the hearing, so we couldn't use that information to um, um, affect our, our decision on this, but we uh, would recommend that um, those issues be raised uh, when the um, applications before the DRB and then they can be taken care of. They didn't, it was just, they came too late, so we couldn't use them. So we, we don't have to vote, we already did. Or do we vote again in public? No, oh. so we're just announcing that we've approved these two. Okay, thank you. Um, so that's nine and 10, right? So now we're moving on to item 11. So we still have Paul. And this is a continued review and possible um, action to adopt proposed amendment to the land development regulations. And specifically, we approved all of them with the exception of the parking requirements for all uses citywide except multifamily housing and accessory dwelling units for which parking requirements are to be reduced. So what is, do you wanna say Sure, so uh, where you are, uh, just as a reminder for yourselves and for the, um, for the audience, is that you held a public hearing on September 16th. Um, as uh, Councilor Greenlee said, the other amendments were adopted. These ones you decided to uh, take no action on either way. Uh, so that you could continue discussion this evening. Uh, you closed the public hearing uh, following your last meeting. Um, this evening, your choices could be, if you would like, um, to adopt the amendments. Uh, if you choose to uh, uh, further your discussion, you can continue to do that tonight and on other nights. If at some point you decide that you would like to make any changes to it, then at that point that will trigger uh, the warning of a new public hearing on whatever the uh, amendments are and a submittal to the planning commission for them to prepare an updated report on the consistency of the amendments with the comprehensive plan. So those are your procedural steps that you can choose to do. Okay. Well, what is your pleasure? Well, I'll just say, if, can I just start? Yeah, so um, I emailed um, some folks and, and um, flew a flag of compromise, if you want to call it that, with uh, maybe some reduced parking uh, minimums and a greater waiver for the DRB. I think that was received pretty well by the DRB, but not received well by the Planning Commission. Um, so I know there's been a lot of uh, angst over this, and I know there have been comments made where, you know, the DRB and the Planning Commission each have their own roles, right? And, and one's legislative and one's quasi-judicial, right? And, and really, you know, I've heard people say that the DRB should follow whatever the Planning Commission has for regulations that we actually, you know, pass, and, and that's that's the proper process. Um, I I just want to say, remind people that um, uh, I visited the state house a few years ago, and Helen Hellhead was there, and, and uh, I can't remember the reason. I think it was the 50th anniversary of the Peace Corps or something like that, right? But I got to sit in on, on a legislative session where Peg Flory was demanding that the House uh, pass the mandatory minimums for certain types of um, assault. And the, uh, there was a, a lot of discussion, especially by the, the assistant DAs around the state, where it would tie their hands and their ability to actually uh, get convictions, right? Because they do a lot of work with the victims in order to get plea deals and not have force the victims to have to testify. And so this would upend all of that. So th that analogy is simply to say that, that the people that prosecute you know, or work in some quasi-judicial mode on these types of issues do have the opportunity to, to provide comment to the legislative body that creates the rules, right? Mm -hmm. So in that case, um, I would be really comfortable if, if we could 
move to a middle ground and just give the DRB a greater waiver percentage uh, and go ahead and, and reboot, reduce those commercial minimums if you'd like to. Um, I, at this point in time, I'm not in favor of, of actually limiting the minimums altogether. I just think it's either premature or unnecessary and we create some some discord between those two bodies and, and it, it's not really necessary to have that so I think we could either forge a compromise if the Planning Commission was willing to or if not and you want to push it through with three to two that might be what happens tonight I don't know but I'm just voicing my concern that that you know it, it's an opportunity to listen to both both sides mm -hmm. of the issue. So I, I also did some um, questioning um, and after um, talking with the chair of the DRB, Matt Kodai, asked him about the rye development because I go out there every week um, for my daughter's violin lesson. And there is, um, in that development, which is behind the counseling clinic and the Happy Tales, and there might be another commercial building there, um, there is the rye circle, which makes a circle, and then there's on-street parking, which is used every time I go past it. And so I put a question out through Kevin to Paul, and his response was, I think, very enlightening. Matt couldn't answer the question, which is why I went through, through Kevin to, to ask Paul. Um, that the current land development regulations in, and help me, Paul, the Southeast Quadrant Limited Commercial? Uh, Village Commercial. Village Commercial um, is actually um, designed in order to create a buffer between the residential and the commercial, that there is, um, you know, there is some kind of transition. And since that is the area that is currently non-developed um, and where we would see, uh, you know, the minimum parking standards um, come into play perhaps the most, um, I found that really compelling, that there are already in the village limited commercial districts in, in the southeast quadrant that there is a buffer already written into our land development regulations that does not have anything to do with our minimum parking requirements. Um, and there was no waiver, there was no quid pro quo, it's just this, these are our land development regulations. And that really put my mind at ease because looking at city center, looking at Kimball Ave, looking at the Kmart Plaza and down off of Route 7, we have seas of parking everywhere. Um, and all I saw as a potential area where there could be some concern with regard to encroachment, you know, businesses saying that they, you know, oh, we'll just park on the street. Um, I was very pleased to read that there are actually um, measures or, or stipulations in our land development regulations to create that transition and that buffer between the commercial properties and the residential properties. I also want to bring to our attention something that we all know, um, but just to remind this body of and, and the public of, that we look at form-based codes in city center and there are parking uh, requirements there. And as we know, we are, as a city, going to be doing one of the solutions that I saw um, in Massachusetts being used, which is you rent parking spaces. And that's what we're doing for our, our community building, our municipal community building. We are going to be renting parking spaces across the street um, in a building that has been renovated to from commercial to residential, which requires much less parking, and now we have parking spaces that are at our disposal through an agreement. And so I think that there, even in our city center, there, we're already seeing solutions that, are, that we have been putting into practice that are um, solutions that the re reduction or the elimination of many parking requirements lead to. Um, and I don't see any other area in the city that really concerns me. And I really thought about it. where in the city could this create an issue? And I, I, I really would like to have that. Be beyond the fact that there are people saying, you know, this is something that the big bad developer is going to take advantage of, um, 
That I, as a as a candidate, I have never made developers into the into the bad guy, and I do not again here. I find um, that to be a, a very facile um, argument, and that and I I, I really um, find it to to be um, not compelling uh, as an argument. Developers, um, of course, need to have review, uh, and I think that. Um, in the end, though, they are looking to sell their buildings. And, and I think that any developer uh, working within the land development regulations in the village limited commercial, where we have our biggest uh, space of, of undeveloped land that these regulations would have the biggest impact on, that regulations already, um, already have um, you know, written into them buffers and protections. Um, so that, uh, in addition to the fact that I, I really, um, for various reasons, I, I think that this planning do document um, is looking into the future, looking into a future where we have to take action now in order to get um, less asphalt on, on our open space, um, think about using that land more create, <coughs> creatively, thinking about how we're going to look in the future. That's what these land developments do um, with regard to creating that buffer, but also uh, the minimum parking requirements that are before us. And, and the other issue and, uh, that I really, really wish to, to bring to everyone's attention is that this is, this is, uh, and my train of thought here, and I'm sorry, it's the end of a long day. Um, uh, it will come back to me, I'm sorry. But anyway, it will come back to me, I apologize. But I really, I really, really think that, oh, I came back to me. Waivers. <laughs> this is my pet peeve. It has been for years, and um, and it is something that I, I addressed on Friday with Helen and Matt, the chair of the DRB. Um, I am not comfortable with the waivers um, that we regularly, uh, as a city, give. I I would like to know more about them. I would like uh, to, for our Planning Commission to work to come up with creative solutions like uh, the parking buffer for the village limited commercial in the southeast quadrant where waivers do not have to come into play. Um, and case in point, I, I have two houses in my neighborhood, um, one where the DRB, after the fact, after it was built, oh, we'll just waiver it. <laughs> and Neighbors are very unhappy about it. And another building where the DRB said, no, we're not going to waiver it. And I would, I would really compliment um, that uh, our current DRB members for holding firm on our land development regulations. And these are carefully thought out regulations. These are regulations um, that I have tested. Um, I've read up on the, the elimination of, of limited parking. And, and what I see is it's simply, you know, it's a, it's a hot cold test. It has nothing to do necessarily with actually proven data that this fails. I see nothing out there suggesting that. It's more, do you have the stomach for it or not? And I think that um, that's not a good enough argument to convince me either. So there we go. Thanks. Tom, so thank I'm, you. Thank you. Uh, so I'm right where I was last time, and I would just say, as I said from the beginning, and I hope I communicated, I support a reduction in parking minimums. I just don't support an elimination of them. I, I just think that's jumping in when we should wade our way into it for all the reasons I articulated previously. And I, this, this is an existing problem. A previous DRB member, Matt Birmingham, caught me, and he reminded me of Timber Lane. He said a waiver, I, I don't know all the specifics, so I'm not going to get specific on it, but parking was a problem with Timber Lane that they had to readdress because neighbor people were parking during business 
service hours in front of the, the neighbors near them. It was causing a lot of conflict and f uh, first responding vehicles couldn't get through there. And it's also happening now. I've, I had met residents of Brookwood contacting me about the new office building there and they've got cars all parked along their streets and now they're asking for resident parking only signs. I, I'm just saying I, I support reducing parking minimums. I just don't support eliminating them and I haven't seen any evidence in the previous yeah. materials <laughs> that show that this is a common thing that be, is being done across the rest of the country. So I, I think as if it does pass 3-2, I still think this would be a big mistake to just jump off and do this. I think we need to listen to the DRB and we need to ask the Planning Commission to work with the DRB to find some middle ground solution. That's where I am. Okay. Do you want to make a comment? Uh, is, the, is the wording still the same as when we saw it the last time? Uh, council gave no direction to change anything from the last time, so it's the same as you had. Did either the Planning Commission or the DRB have any recommendations for changing any of the wording? Planning Commission did not, um, they were not asked to make any no, recommendations. Um, I believe DRB members talked and uh, I think the two of the members are here if you wanted to get their uh, individual feedback. As a board, I don't believe they weighed, they, they took any formal action, but members, <coughs> I know, discussed it. Well, Actual wording? What? Actual wording? I think that might be a better question asked directly of them, okay. of whether they have we general have comments or actual words. Do you want to yes. speak for the committee? Frank, you want to? Frank drafted some changes. Actually, since you mentioned actual words, I need to come to lose. Good evening. Yeah. Matt Coda from uh, Hugo, Development Review Board and uh, the Wine Sap Planning Lane. Commission. Which word? Huh? Went up first or for the dear viewer here? <laughs> is Frank open? And um, so, yes, we have actually, Frank being the primary author, drafted language uh, that we believe is a compromise that uh, allows us to waive more than the 25% that we currently do and to reduce the minimum requirements. No, no one's pro impervious pavement here. We don't want more pavement than needed, uh, but we do want to make sure that. A developer doesn't have to be bad. A developer may make a mistake. And we want to make sure we have seven people that can view the, the project, can make sure that if parking isn't planned or is improperly planned, that there's another set of eyes on it. And if we don't require any minimum at all, they don't even have to talk to us about it. We have no power, no leverage at all. Uh, and we're here to fix problems, fix problems when the developer has something that the uh, a joining party doesn't like, uh, interested party doesn't like. We're here to make sure that it works for the city, but we'll have no power if you take away our minimums. See, this is what bothers me is that there's going to be massive redevelopment over the next 20 years along Williston Road and along Shelburne Road. There are a lot of old structures that are going to get purchased and raised and something new is going to be rebuilt, right? And, and each of those individual redevelopments is going to be reviewed by these gentlemen or their successors. And I want to make sure that they have the right tools to be able to make corrections when there are boundaries with residential areas that could be negatively affected if they don't have the proper authority to, you know, to, to change the amount of parking if necessary. If you go to, you know, to no minimums, then they won't have any power at all. Every one of these redevelopments and any new developments is individually evaluated, you know, from the work that planning and zoning does, and, and it, it stands on its own merits from the application by the developer, and it has its own idiosyncrasies, and I, I think that they have the ability to understand what those are relative to the surrounding areas, and I don't want them to lose the ability to make recommendations or say yay or nay to developers when they, when they make bad choices, because sometimes bad choices happen. Well, I would just respond that there are seas of parking on Williston Road and on Shelburne Road I'm not Road talking currently. about the parking that's there now. I'm talking about the parking of the future. We have the same goal in mind. We want less impervious uh, pavement, less, less impervious services. We want a better transportation model for the state, right? We want fewer cars on the road. We want better mass transit which is more effective in urban and suburban environments than it is in rural environments, right? And we're gonna get there, but you've got some older developments and some newer developments that are coming that are gonna test the minimums and, and might have negative consequences. And, and so, I mean, so the difference is, you know, 
let's say you have application X and you had no minimums and the developer wanted to put in 20 parking spots, right? And let's say you had the alternative, right, where they had to put in uh, they had to put in 40, but they asked for a waiver to get down to 20. It's the same result. You're still going to have 20, whatever it is, right? Because the developer is going to want whatever it needs, to, whatever they perceive is what their client wants to have for parking, because that's half the time, like we heard before, the, the app. The, you got to do business. The, the, the developers, if they're redeveloping a property, they usually have a client that's going to bring the business, and that client has got their own requirements for how many parking spaces they need per thousand square feet, mm -hmm. right? So, so I think that giving them, letting them retain some of the ability to have that number be flexible up or down is, is a small price to pay. You're still gonna get to where you wanna go. Well, you know, I think that the, the, the examples that have been brought forward, we all received an email from John Dinklage. Healthy living is just waiting for that city center development to occur so that Healthy living much doesn't have a problem. The Trader Joe's Healthy Living is a PUD with shared parking. People can very well park at Healthy Living. It always has tons of parking out back and they can walk over to Pier 1 and Trader Joe's. I don't have any issues. I never did when we were looking at, 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 at that PUD about shared parking. No, that was no, fine. I don't either. I totally so, agree. That so was my I, point, I don't, Tim. Any complaints <laughs> that you hear about Trader Joe's not having enough parking? Yes. If you can't park at Trader Joe's, then please go over and park at Healthy Living. It's not a problem. That's right. All right? So I don't even think that's an issue that we have to talk about. It's not, it's not relevant to the discussion. We're right. talking about future developments where they need some leeway to be able to make those decisions that the DRB is supposed to make. All right. Well, let's just talk about that hypothetical hypothetical, which we, I have not yet seen an example of. I like it when people park on the road. Now, I'm not in favor of people parking, you know, to go take a flight and be gone for two weeks and park out on Maryland, yeah, right? That doesn't, that makes no sense to me. So no parking signs there. But I like people parking on my road because it slows down the cars. But those are right? people that live on your street. No, not all of them. No, they're people that come in and they stay a week with, with my neighbors. They're not necessarily people But they're people who, that are in the residential homes on your street, right? But I think that I chose to live in an area where I am close to the amenities. All right, so I don't have to take my car. So I can walk to the bus stop. So I can walk to the grocery store. Or I can bike ride to drop a letter off at the post You're gonna office. You're going to bike ride in January. No, but I can walk to the post office in January and because we have handy dandy little sidewalk plows that I never saw until I came to Vermont that allow me to get there. I think we're maybe. getting off the topic. Yes, I we know, are. I want to go off topic on this. Are you going to stop using your car entirely in the state of Vermont if in the next 10 years? For the is, next 10 years. Is, is that your, your that goal is to never lovely. use your car again? I would, I would love to do that. And, and I think a lot of but people Tim, would also I don't like think to this do will, But we can always go back to, to the drawing board. I'm trying to get board. to the bottom. We're yeah. trying to find out what is required here. We're trying to find out right. if, park, if no parking minimums is any better than giving these people the ability to waive parking down to a number that's it's going to be the same as what they're going to get with no parking. But, <laughs> well, so then yeah. why do they need the waiver? Because it if gives them the ability to, the right to waive number. the abutter's rights. The abutter's rights in these situations, every application is different. That's why they get to review them. My, my point is that our regulations, just like in the southeast quadrant with the village light commercial, our regulations have already prepared for those buffers. And that's what our planning commission is now currently working on with the PUDs. They are looking at those buffers. And I am very impressed with how that rye circle operates. And that's why I asked about it. And if that is the future of South Burlington, it is nothing that we should feel bad about. I think it's something that we should encourage and just feeling a little queasy because someone doesn't have power is not enough is not enough to no convince parking, me there were no there were no no parking minimums on that ride development right the developers looked at that they have a they have a building that has counseling they have parking the next commercial building has parking the next commercial building has parking there is a major street in back of them with parking on both sides i bike through there all the time once in a while there are one or two cars on that street and it's the same cars mm. every time. I see eight I don't when know I go past. cars they are. It could yeah. be the counselors in the counselor building. Mm -hmm. But the point is, is that there, there were parking minimums. And I don't know if they had to waive anything. I don't remember what we did. But the point is that, that you they know. Waived the, one, <coughs> one parking space. There was one parking space waived. I asked, fine, <laughs> one, whatever it was. But the point was that that development seems to work. It's working pretty well now. DRB had a chance to weigh on in it, and they made a decision. 
Okay. But it was our land development regulations. The DRB, and I asked, was there any waiver? No, except for this one parking space. Was there any quid pro quo? No. So it was a, it good, was it was just, a good plan from the developer then? It was because of our land development regulations. And I have confidence that our planning commission is going to do the same thing when they come out with their PUDs. And if you have and confidence, that's what then you we'll, should be willing to give them the chance to make the decision then. But I think, I You're think. You're going to end up at the same number. I don't like waivers, number one, and I. And they wave all the time. You have developers coming. That's in a saying, problem I to need me. Sixteen spots. I have to have twenty, or I have to have thirty. Yeah. I can't wave them down far enough at twenty-five percent. Yeah. Just expand the number, reduce the minimums. You'll get to the same spot. I, I don't see that they have the same kind of thinking and discussion that the planning commission has. The planning so commission I do is not want to regulations. Seed. They are the ones where the rubber hits the road. They they look at every application relative to the abutters, and, and those are singular those are singular situations that only those seven people can adjudicate. Yes. That's what they're there for, yes. is to adjudicate. I understand. But as you know, that nothing is perfect, Tim. As you know, you've lived long enough to know that, that there are constantly things that the DRB might not have seen or that the Planning Commission has to go back to the drawing board. But the one that we talk about for the drawing board with regard to what happened at, at next to 180, I think is the architects, okay? So I'll just leave it at that. I don't think that everything comes down to lack of foresight on the Planning Commission's part. That said, if there is a situation where we have to go back to the drawing board, we can do that. And that is something that we discussed with so Matt. Let's go the we'll compromise first, and if that works for five years, then we'll go to no minimums. Then. I, I don't ask a understand question? why. I don't see the need, other than they're not ready. You have seven examples of people that see a need. No. And eight and nine. I, but they've not provided any data that is convincing to me. Okay, I got a question. Did you have suggested wording? Yes. Yes. Where is it? We sent it. I sent it to. I didn't single, see it. I sent it to you. I must have missed it. I sent it to everybody. You, you all should have it at on your on your email. I can tell you what it, I can tell you what it, can't it says. Can't be very long, so go ahead and. It, it, it's not. It, it's not long. Uh, what I wrote to you first of all, there was a cover email that said, "This this, this is it right here. That's how much space it takes up." Is it all right? Do you mind if he reads it? No. I, I don't know. You don't have to read it. He can describe it. Can yeah, he I can, you know, I, 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 Paraphrase. Let's, you know, like. Well, I'll tell you, but I also want to talk about what the new criteria are, because they're very specific, and they address the issue of waivers that are ill-considered or, or, don't, or don't have enough parameters around them to be well-considered. Um, what this does is give us the authority, what my draft does, is give us the authority to reduce parking down to zero if need be, um, but on an expanded set of criteria for waivers. I'll tell you what they are. Right now, our only, the only things we're supposed to consider are unique physical, unique physical conditions and, uh, and uh, the availability of shared parking. It's not enough. These criteria are violated all the time. Uh, development Review Board from time to time has made arbitrary decisions. I don't disagree with, with that observation. I've for a long time been a proponent of more sculpted criteria that address the full range of issues. Here's what I think they are. And I'm open to further discussion with the Planning Commission about that or with you. The criteria, the things to take into account with the exercise of what's supposed to be a wise discretion, as listed here are unique physical features of the lot, the desirability of, of limiting the creation of impermeable surface, the availability of shared parking for the development, either existing or demonstrated by the applicant to become available upon completion, the adequacy of public transportation service for the development, either existing or demonstrated by the applicant to become available upon completion. What I, well, I'll, I'll come back if you want me to. Uh, the impact of the waiver on public infrastructure, such as, without limitation, publicly operated structured parking. F, the physical and economic, fee and economic feasibility of the structured parking for the site. 
G, the impact of the waiver on adjoining and or nearby properties, and H, the impact of the waiver on adjoining and or nearby on-street parking. Now that is a body, an expanded body of actual considerations, factors, the developers on notice. Come in prepared to talk about this stuff. Come in with your deal with Chittenden County Transportation Authority that says, I'm putting 150 new apartments here, and here's the guy from, from CCTA or whatever, whatever that's called, mm -hmm. telling me what the new bus schedule is going to be to service my development upon completion. We don't have anything like that now. That addresses the panoply of what you're, you should be governmentally concerned with, which is not just a desperate lunge into some fantasy future where people will magically figure out how to get downtown in February. That kind of characterization but, I find disrespectful. When we study the land development regulations at, Rye, at the Rye Development... i take it back, but was, I'd like to finish. Yes. Yeah. I apologize. All right. Uh, you have a body of practical considerations have a go as a government to take into a town and is not j into account and is not just the elimination of the of uh, the potential elimination of parking the the, uh, the elimination of, of minimums it what happens if public transportation being high on the list the encouragement of developers <coughs> to come in with a full bodied plan to address the entire list anyway Yes. You have the list. You all have it on your email. I don't know who has printed it out. I'm sorry it was a week ago. Paul? Okay, you just described what's in your recommendation, right? Pardon? You just described what's in your... I did. Okay, so I'm curious as to what the Planning Commission thinks of that. Can we switch places? Sure. Is that allowed? Sure. Um, so three of us are here this evening, um, but I'd like to say that we can only speak on um, our previous conversations. As a body, we did not specifically review and vote on any kind of response to this, um, what he just described. Um, but I think a few things um, are I mean, mo we've already discussed it. <laughs> so, so a lot of the things that he has suggested um, are things that we have discussed as part of um, you know all the deliberations before we submitted to you our recommendation. Um, I guess just for clarification, he talked about multifamily housing. Um, this recommendation we put in front of you does not apply to multifamily housing. Um, we felt like that was one thing that we really wanted to keep that number the way it was. Um, so there isn't a change to that type of. It's a reduction, but not an elimination. Oh, yeah, reduction, but not an elimination. So it's it's not a reduction or elimination of the minimum. Um, and I think a big point um, I wanted to make is that we know change is hard, and this is obviously um, a difficult discussion that people have been having. Um, but just because um, this idea isn't common, um, it doesn't mean that it's bad. Um, I don't know that we need to necessarily wait till everybody else is doing something to do it. Um, there's lots of research and evidence to show that it is a good idea. Um, also, it's not like we've had parking minimums in place forever. Um, Ours and a lot of the community, uh, communities surrounding us have only been having these regulations in place for about the last 30 years. There's an awful lot of our development that was done before that period, before minimum parking requirements were part of our regulations. Um, so we're kind of going back to that situation. Um, there are, um, we, I think you were emailed an article by a, a professor of planning, Donald Shoup, and there were a few things in there that I thought were really um, kind of... Excuse me, is that, yeah. one, is that the one you... Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very well written. You know, it had a lot of really great points in it, and I think um, I just wanted to make a couple of those points. So what we've done with our, our previous development, you know, the way our zoning has been for a long time, is we've separated our land uses. So. People live separate from where we work. 
So that's created a need to travel. We've lowered our densities and really spread stuff out. So there's distances between the things we're trying to get to. And we've had lots, we've required a lot of free parking that's paid for by landowners. And you know, all of those things are really in place to support cars. So when we look back at our comprehensive plan, which we did huge amounts of outreach for, there's four main overarching goals. And the second one, one, one of the four is walkability. So you know, if we're gonna continue to have all of our regulations really focus on cars, you know, we're not gonna get to that point of walkability, um, and which is what we heard loud and clear from the citizens. Um, one of the other things that I saw in that article that I thought was really interesting is that it said specifically, despite all the harm off-street parking requirements cause, there's almost an established religion in city planning. You know, the idea that we've talked about this, it's been parking, num the number of parking spots has been such a huge part of our discussion and such a huge part of laying out sites. I'm a civil engineer, like I've done site design. And one of the first things you do is you look up your parking minimum and you make sure you have that amount of parking space. And, you know, I just don't know that that's what we want to do with our land. Do we really want our land to be, and our land development to be based on the number of parking spaces? You know, we've been hearing from the community, we want natural resources, we want affordable housing, we want more jobs. You know, those are things that are not directly tied to the number of parking spaces. And, you know, it just doesn't make sense to me that our policy going forward should continue to be the number of parking spaces when there's so many other things we're really trying to do with our land. Um, you know, letting the market decide, you know, you have experts who are creating um, a destination that want to attract people there and people drive, you know, and I don't think they're gonna just be shooting themselves in the foot by having no parking. Um, so I think those are some big points. Um, I also think that, you know, the DRBs, uh, or the, you know, Frank's language that he proposed, um, you know, it, it gets back to assuming that there's a right number. So if you're assuming that that number out of the book is somehow some kind of right number, and then you have to somehow prove through subjective means that you should be allowed to reduce it, it all comes back to the Development Review Board having to pick, pick and choose what they think the right number is. And, you know, I feel like even though there's some criteria that's listed, all of those things really are very subjective. You know, does it mean that you aren't allowed to get a waiver if there's a residential street nearby because you're afraid that parking might spill over onto that residential street? Like, how do you somehow get to a number that is acceptable, like it creates a lot of uncertainty. Like how could someone possibly come forward with a proposal that would get approved if there's no idea, like what, I don't wanna use the word whim, but like what the DRB is gonna somehow come up with as that right number, um, you know, which, which is a big reason why I think waivers are something that we've been trying to get away from, like trying to make our our um, land development regulations predictable, like what people are really gonna get um, should be pretty clear. And if you could potentially waive 100%, I mean, there's so much leeway. There's, there's no predictability about what you're gonna get an approval for. Um, and you might put an awful lot of effort into trying to prove all these things with, with no specific outcome that you're gonna get. Um, we've been asked by both the DRB and the city council almost yearly to reduce waivers, to create more predictability both for the public and for the applicant. And um, you know, this is one way that we came up, you know, we're proposing to reduce um, one of the waivers. And I think that might be it. Did you have some other things? I mean, we had a lot of discussion. Not specific, but in, in general, I mean, a aspirationally, this community has has asked uh, the council, the planning commission, to make South Burlington less car-centric. And the other 
thing is that the drive for mixed development, which means residential and commercial, uh, the more the more successful we are with that, the less you will require public transit or cars to get to work because you can walk. Um, and in the end, this is a, a balance between risk and reward. And uh, I think the rewards for doing this, um, cutting down on traffic, cutting down on pollution, uh, cutting down on impervious surfaces, the, the rewards are outweigh the risks that um, the DRB has raised. I have to, I, have to <laughs> I almost laughed when you said, if you were a developer, you look at the development, and then the first thing you look at is what? Because as an engineer, you look parking. at what, how many parking places Number are required. Number of parking. Yeah. And then what do you say after that? In my mind, I was saying, and how many, how many am I going to ask to be waived? That was, that was the next, which is exactly when I, I did a, a small development. You know, it was, uh, okay, this is what we want to build. This is what's required. Okay, now how big a waiver can we get? So I understand. Which is a really good um, point. I think that's the first thing every developer likely says. Here's what's required. Actually, actually it's waiver. not. It's actually, not? it's not. No. The, uh, it's generally for most developers. Now, there are some at the top and there are some at the bottom. But if you take the bulk of the developers, uh, what's their primary job? To generate rent, to generate revenue. The longer it takes them to do that, the less money they make. They're going to take the path of least resistance. Not only do developers typically hire a civil engineer up front, what they don't do is hire a land planner to actually figure out how to make them work better for everybody. There are a few developers that do, but most of them don't. It's problematic in the business. Um, I find it interesting. Are you done? I just should have. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Are you good? Um, I find it interesting. <laughs> and I'm not going to you know, um, whether it's intentional or not, there, there's this wedge that seems to be being driven between the DRB and the, and the Planning Commission. And that's not the way that volunteer boards and commissions should actually be working. I also find it interesting, and maybe it's due to the professional makeup of the DRB, that this has become somewhat of a litigation. That all of a sudden we now have seven development experts that are dictating exactly what should and shouldn't be done. Two years of effort went into this recommendation by the Planning Commission. We are not experts in anything. There was a lot of research that was done. There was a lot of discussion that happened. And jointly, we came to this place. If you're going to provide waivers to a body that has no expertise in something that they're supposed to provide waivers for. And I will respectfully disagree, Tim. They're not going to end up at the same place. It won't happen because they're going to have the discretion to tell the developer that he's wrong or she's wrong without knowing anything about their business because they feel like there should be more parking. Is that really the way that we want to run growth and have a sustainable community here in South Burlington? There is a reason that these two bodies are separate. They should remain separate. If they want to make recommendations, we hold all of our meetings in the public for the public. They should participate. The topics are warned. It should not wait until we get to a recommendation period for them to decide that they are not happy with the recommendations being made after two years worth of work and then throwing out language that is inflammatory about how fast or how inefficient or how inaccurate or how lazy the process was. That should not be tolerated by the city council or the community. It is just not acceptable. So what I think is we've had a really healthy discussion and that it's gone on for a couple of weeks. And I think, um, I think I, I'd like to make things fair and, and uh, perhaps more simplified going forward because I don't like things getting too complicated. And, Right now, this has sounded like it's getting too complicated, and, uh, and you all have done a tremendous amount of work on this. And um, nice. from my perspective, I think that's, that's, where we should, that's where we should be, and that's where we should go. Can I say one but thing? But I don't, I don't think, I think your point is, is whoever made the point is, um, these committees should work together, and we can have, we can have lengthy discussions, we can have, we can have uh, disagreements, but we're all, in the end, after the same 
have the same end goals. I would and disagree, so, David, respectfully. That you is what? Not what? That is not the case here. It we is all not. should have the same end goals. Agreed. I will certainly agree with that. Put the word should in there. Yeah. But at this point, I'm, uh, I'm good. Okay. You, you've done a nice job. Thank Tom, you. Tom, we'll have a comment from you, and then thing. I'm ready to vote. I think you opened up the conversation by saying that you're not speaking for the whole planning commission, and the whole planning commission has, has not considered this very formal DRB feedback. And I think the process has worked how it's supposed to. You've worked this to this point, and you've collected a community feedback, and it's not just the DRB that's speaking up. I think since there is no hurry, I don't have I have not been presented any time pressure on this. And the last time we considered parking considerations and the the other regulations regarding um, when I forgot what the name of it was, but we had eight public hearings on it. What I would just ask, I think we all want to do this right. We all want to get to the right place. We want to get to a better place. I think it makes a lot of sense to have the Planning Commission just consider what the DRB has put forward. And if you come together, as all seven of you, again, or a majority of you, saying, no, we still stand by what we did, I think that is a very fair next step. And it makes sense for a lot of different reasons. So I would, again, discourage this council from acting tonight because there's no time pressure on us doing so. And with all this feedback, time helps get everybody on the same page. Jessica Tom, said there, is, a, there is a time factor, the though. They've spent two years on this. They've addressed all of the concerns and argued and debated uh, within the commission, planning commission, all of those issues. We have given them an incredible amount of work. So to say, well, two years isn't quite enough, so spend another month or two and, and, here, put off, <laughs> and, here. and put off some other things that do have a time crunch, like IZ, I think is not. Um, this is that important to wait. Doesn't so. make um, any sense to me. It's just that important to wait. That's what so, I would say. I'm going to go so, ahead. So, oh, Tom, yeah. just um, yeah. one thing. So, specifically, the Planning Commission did consider increasing the waiver authority of the DRB as one of our options, and we decided that was not the way we wanted to go specifically. So that was a criteria. response. The five criteria sound very reasonable, and I love it's, the GMT piece. So I just, why, yeah. not, why not go through it? Why we rub did consider, I'm, I'm, I just wanted to be clear, that was not just me talking. That was like one of our options that was not put forward. So I'd like to move ahead, go ahead and move that we adopt the proposed amendment to the land development regulations to eliminate minimum parking requirements for all uses citywide except multifamily housing and accessory dwelling units for which parking requirements are to be reduced. That's LDR 19-01. I'll second it. Yes. We have a chance for a member of the public to speak. Um, yeah, you asked me, um, we're about an hour and a half behind schedule. You have a written statement, correct? Has been modified as I've been listening to the conversation. Um, can you, can I give you two minutes and can you? That would be fine, ma'am. Okay, and then I would, we have a motion moved and seconded, so I would like then to have a vote and I, move on. Okay. Thank you. For the record, my name is David Crawford. I want to make clear that I am not here representing any of the com committees that I have the privilege of serving on. Uh, I would also say that the I am on a I'm chair of the NRC, and those members are aware that I'm making a statement personally. What are the concerns? I find great identity with a goal that's being presented by the Planning Commission. It's a good goal. I'm just, it, it just seems like it's not the right time to 100% adopt it. The proposal that uh, to eliminate part the parking requirements for the commercial developments uh, doesn't have to be, comp you know, you can make it waiver go down to zero if Frank's whatever they are, six or five uh, uh, conditions are put on that. We're talking about, in, we say, where is this going to be needed? Infill. That's, that's really where I see it happening. I've got to speak to the, the goal. 
I'm trying to improve personally so I can ride my, I ride my bicycle more. That's great, but I don't live very far from City Hall. And I come here, go by it a couple times a day, and I come here almost every couple times a week. I can't ride my bicycle here. I'm too old. I can't do it. It's a worthwhile goal for me, but I can't make it. And there's a lot of people in that situation. Now, very simply, let the waiver go down to 100% under the criteria that Frank has put forward. That can be a very simple motion. And it works. If it doesn't work, speaking as a taxpayer, somebody's going to have to pay for the infiltration and all the rest. And that's going to be us taxpayers. We're going to have to fix the, the thing with more parking. Let it try to work. That's my statement. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say Dave is one of three members of the public who have contacted me and um, in opposition to this, whereas members of our energy committee are totally in favor of this. Other members of the Natural Resources Committee are in favor of this. There are members of the community in favor of this that I have talked to, and three just does not rise to the level of um, of, of me having to, to put a hold on this. Elimination of minimum parking requirements does not eliminate parking. You will still be able to drive to City Hall, David. I agree, but I, I'm pointing out that there's a group of us out there that agree with the goal that the Planning Commission is putting forward. The question is, can we really take and put that goal into effect now for the whole, for all the places where infiltration is going to happen, where all this judgment should happen? You've got a citizens group, a quasi judicial bodily that you delegate to, to weigh with the criteria that you have them on them. And Frank's enlarged on that. He's the. the Development Review Board is begging for it. It seems to me to be logical to say we can take a little step okay. toward that direction. Senior Thank you. you. Let, uh, I okay. think we could debate this for the rest of the evening. I we have a, a motion on the table that's been made and seconded. Are you ready for the vote? No, I'd like to say one more thing. Yes. So I just would say at the last meeting it was just said, Asked, challenged the DRB to come up with some additional language. More time will get us to a better place. Even if it's the same place, I just think everybody will feel better about it. I just don't see why it has to happen tonight. So I would encourage some more time. Let the Planning Commission look at what the DRB said. That's the right way to do it. And that's all I'm going to say. Well, Tom, I think, that's, I think that's all well and good. But I recall that I said two weeks ago that, that if in two weeks nothing had changed and we were looking at the same language that I was going to support it. And, and there have been discussions about what could have changed, but nothing's, nothing's changed, and I'm good for it. They proposed the changes. The Planning Commission hasn't considered it. Well, I, I, I would weeks. disagree with I'm that going. characterization. I think they have considered all of those items and okay, came up the, with this. They have not considered it as an alternative package from Frank. But all of the items, as I understand it, particularly the waivers, were debated and determined by the Planning Commission that that was not the way they wanted to go about um, suggesting changes to Not changing your vote to ask for more time for people to consider things, so. We ready for the vote? Okay, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Nay. Okay, so the motion passes three to two. Thank you very much. Charlie Baker, you're up next. Well, we took one we at 8.30, so I think we've already had a break. Well, we had a break at 8.30, so are you okay, Sue, since we had a break earlier? Yeah, okay. For a while. Oh, I Okay. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, glad to be here on such a momentous night. <laughs> My 
I hope uh, we're not cranky for you. No, no, no. Uh, no, that's a very difficult topic. Um, and uh, glad to see the city trying to address it. Um, so, um, Charlie Baker, I'm the executive director of the Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission, here to give my annual report to the city. Um, this is really a customer service call for us. Uh, the city is one of our valued members. Um, and so I'm here really to get any feedback on how we're doing in terms of providing service to the city and anything we can do better or, or uh, any feedback you want to give me is welcome. The report I believe you had in your packet, I'm going to just run through that real quickly. I know you've already been here a long time. <laughs> um, so the first page is really background on the Regional Planning Commission, uh, who's on our board, a little bit about our budget, about how we leverage your dues to bring in federal and state funds, and then who your representatives are. Um, Chris Shaw sends his apologies. He is ill tonight, or he would be here tonight. Um, and uh, he's not only is on the board now, but he's also a member of our executive committee. Um, so uh, Chris is uh, doing going extra meetings and extra uh, input into our processes. And thank you for all the the appointees and Megan as an alternate and all your staff that serves on our committees. Uh, they all contribute a lot of value to those groups. Um, on the second page. And on the third page, and going on to the fourth page, um, I think you guys may be the winners for the longest uh, list of things that we're doing with the municipality. Um, I'm not going to read each one of those. I think you're probably hearing about them in different venues from different groups of your, you know, your planning commission or other uh, committees that are uh, working on this, on these different projects. Um, but uh, you've know, been, uh, I think, trying to help you with, like, and pedestrian issues and parking issues, um, recreation path, intersection turning movements, interim zoning, traffic overlay district. So a variety of things and just data also, uh, traffic counts and other things. So uh, please uh, please keep getting value out of your dues. And uh, <laughs> so uh, I, the other reason I come in the fall is uh, just to give you a heads up that uh, around Thanksgiving time, we send out a request for request for FY21 projects. Um, those are due uh, late half of January. So um, if you're thinking about things for that we can help the city with in FY21, um, you know, I'm, sure, uh, I'm sure Justin and Paul do not seem to have any lack of topics that they are, or Kevin or Tom. <laughs> so, um, or probably you guys as well. Um, but we're happy to help and it's been a good partnership with the city. Um, on the bottom of the fourth page onto the fifth page is a number of projects that are in our transportation improvement program, which mirrors the state's capital program. Um, and I'm not going to review any of those, but you can see we try to have what the uh, budget is and the at least the schedule right now. Um, as you know, things that are in the state you know capital program that are out a couple years, you know, sometimes move a little bit. Things that are closer are much more uh, much more certain. Um, on the bottom of page five are the things that are we're working on in this fiscal year with you, including uh, that traffic overlay uh, district um, impact fees uh, that I hope we're finalizing this fiscal year, Queen City Park Road sidewalk and a multi-use path connecting Wilson and South Burlington. Um, and then the last uh, few pages are things that we do without regard to any specific municipality. Uh, implementing our and tracking our regional plan, our ECOS plan, legislative forum, building homes together campaign, energy planning, emergency management, clean water, stormwater issues, uh, transportation, um, elderly and uh, disabled transit, um, a, a whole variety of things. Um, and the 89 study, which we kicked off this summer, um, is probably the single biggest thing on our plate in the next year or two. Um, and of course, uh, South Burlington, um, this is really, I think, a follow-up to the CERC, or the not CERC, or the CERC alternatives, as it turned into. Um, but the CERC was intended to take traffic around Chittenden County and avoid the congestion at exit 14, right? Um, CERC is obviously not happening in the way it was intended. We have a lot of alternative projects that are happening in those, in those communities from Colchester, Essex, Williston. Um, however, that still left the issue at exit 14. Uh, and so the 89 study is really uh, picking up uh, that final piece of what do we do in terms of the regional transportation system to deal with what happens at exit 14 and any solutions. Uh, in our long range transportation plan, 
what we found was that the uh, and again this is this is some modeling which I'm a little loath to bring up but um, you know as we look into the future um, and you know with a much more reasonable population growth rate um, but still some uh, some pretty typical trend data in terms of car ownership and things like that I mean if that changes dramatically in the future that changes assumptions but uh, we're still looking at really having a problem at exit 14 uh, going into the future and trying to figure out what to do, which you know, may include some interchange improvement in, in South Burlington. Um, when we did some modeling, an interchange either north or south of exit 14 had kind of the same benefit to the network. It took enough traffic off of 14 so that 14 functioned and distributed traffic. Um, so anyway, that's a long introduction to that project. Um, I think we ended up including 12B, just because that one was a little bit more fleshed out. We had looked at that a little bit more deeply. Um, but that was just uh, a straw man. Um, so we'll definitely be looking at you know 12B, uh, a full 13, or a 14N um, in this uh, 89 study. If there's a better answer, a solution that comes up, we'll look at that too. But um, those are the full three Full 13 things. you're looking at. Some version of it we will look at. Yep. So, um, so anyway, that's just heads up. You know, uh, the consultants kind of doing background work uh, in this half of the calendar year. In 2020, we'll get to more substantive conversations, and I expect we'll end up in front of whichever bodies you tell us to talk to in in the city. Uh, certainly, city council, but probably your planning commission. I don't know what other committees you might want us to uh, have that conversation with. Um, and certainly, we'll be having public forums as well. To get just broader public input on that, because it's it's a big deal to either you know to either not do or do, and then which thing to do. Um, we're also looking at just um, maintenance issues for the interstate. It's over well, it's over 50 years old now, and so you know just the bridges and structures, and even and this hadn't really occurred to me, but even just the pavement base, um, you know the VTrans engineers are like. Ultimately, you got to go down and actually replace the base of the uh, pavement. So, of the um, interstate, the whole interstate. Uh, everything, wow. I guess, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so they, yeah. North, so, they they did go down. Pretty there's deep. well, there's right. places that was a culvert. I think you probably saw. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was uh, not. That wasn't. Well, yeah, that's kind of a maintenance thing. But um, so anyway, and I think this is a little bit interesting because we're not just looking at capacity issues or safety issues, but also just the asset management maintenance issues. Um, VTrans wanted to make sure we looked at those kinds of things too. So if they have to replace, uh, you know, a bridge like that, that may give opportunities to, you know, put in bike paths or sidewalks at, where they don't exist now because it wasn't designed with those features. So um, as an example. So anyway, it's, you know, there's still the sustainability layer over it. Um, I think we have the same shared goals as, as the city, as you were just talking about, <coughs> um, just making our community more sustainable and livable. Um, so just, sorry, that's a heads up. I didn't mean to go into a big tangent there, but it's a, it is a big project with a, with South Burlington as the epicenter of that conversation. So I know. Now I open up a can of worms. <laughs> Anything on my report, or we can talk about any of these projects? I love the Bluetooth traffic lights, but no, nah, I don't want to waste our time. Is that a waste? Yeah. yeah. That was at 16, the DDI. Did you have much to do with that? Yeah, that was, uh, I mean, that was started with planning work that we did. Um, and it was uh, our initial conceptual plan that came up with the DDI as a solution there. That was your, your initial plan, uh, concept? Yep. The, the website is great, by the way. Yeah, so some of the initial modeling where you saw like kind of the model traffic mm -hmm. cars was stuff that we did initially. Um, and I think VTrans has now had the opportunity to refine some of that and make it look a little nicer than. So I posted did. that plan with the video on my Facebook page and got replies from people around the country that I know who said, oh, we have one of those. It yeah. works well. Yeah. I, I drove <laughs> through. I was like, of... excellent. Anything to get the Costco gas pumps early, open earlier would be really nice. Thank you. Please. <laughs> I drove through one a few months ago, yeah, in, in another state, and without even really realizing it, you know, it was like so seamless. You, you, know, you follow the traffic lane, you do what you're supposed to do, right? You, mm -hmm. um, keep the yellow on the left and the right, the white on the right. The, the DDI means uh, diverging diamond interchange for those people who don't know, right? So it's the redesign for the interchange underneath the overpass at exit 16, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, and it really is really designed to get rid of the um, reducing numbers of left turners to make it right. left turn free flow um, so that because it's really left turns at intersections that kill time um, and make everybody wait and and frankly will also make it a lot safer and you get uh, pedestrian bicycle. pedestrian bike access yeah. right yeah. yeah that was amazing could I know I, I know this is South Burlington focus but the one-way bridge um, down to Central Avenue the Queen City Park Road mm -hmm. do you have any plans for any renovations there no I think that was something <coughs> that, uh, that both cities uh, asked us to look at this. We're looking at it right now in terms of uh, uh, for sidewalk scoping. Um, but I think that is a bridge. I don't, I don't know what the actual ownership is. It may be jointly owned between the two cities, um, you know, which I think is just make it historically a challenge in terms of when it's or how it's going to get replaced. But I don't know. It's been a long time, I think, since we've scoped what to do with that bridge. Did you want to ask about Bluetooth? Stuff? No, I would waste time. I'm glad <laughs> to see it. Yeah, I think we're trying to get, you know get more data collected and and get things uh, more um, connectivity with the traffic signals. I think um, I thank you guys um, and the city for moving ahead with um, all the traffic signal improvements that you're going to be doing at 14 and Dorset Street. There's going to be a big improvement in our region. <laughs> If the, if, but I thought the money for that was held up. No, it got released. We got it. Back. It got released. Oh, good. Right. Yeah, that took a You're little right. little juggling. What's that? You're helping with that project? Uh, we did do some help. I don't know. I think probably Justin has most of it now. Um, it's in our court. But, um, but I think, you know, we had, we tried to help with some conversation with VTrans. You know, I think last, uh, last budget cycle in the legislature, you know, hadn't gotten in. And so it was um, a little, getting it into the budget was a little bit of a, a little hurdle, but we got over <laughs> it. So. Well, thank you. I thought your report was, was it was great. Yeah. It really, um, I was impressed with how much you are doing for South Burlington. <laughs> impressed with yourselves for how much you're doing, so. And, um, but it, it was good to read and I appreciate it. Thank you. I look yeah. forward to seeing your report here at Williston Road, Dorset Street intersection lane assignment evaluation. That's. Yeah, I haven't yeah. heard about that lately, so we'll, we'll pick that back up and see where that is. Right. Thank you. Thank Thanks you, Charlie. and I'm sorry you had to wait so long. By the way, Charlie hosts a monthly meeting of city managers, which is very useful for all of us to get together. So thank you for doing that. And a lot of good things, and a, a lot of credit. I should should have given some credit to Kevin. You know, things like the community outreach program. You know, came out of a conversation one day at lunch. You know, two two years ago. But uh, so credit for moving things forward. He's good at that. Okay, <laughs> item 14, authorization to city manager to execute a contract amendment for a guaranteed maximum price for 180 Market Street with Engelberg Construction. Alana just left the room. Where'd she go? <laughs> she just left. There's <laughs> <laughs> you're up. For the next two items. <laughs> Good evening and welcome. Thank you. Um, for the record, Alana Blanchard, Project Director. Um, I'm here uh, tonight to uh, both give you an update on the budget for uh, 180 Market Street and to ask you to consider a resolution to approve a guaranteed maximum price for the project. Um, this project is uh, being lined up for construction, um, anticipated to start uh, at the end of the month, beginning of next month. Um, and uh, I, over a year ago, the city contracted with uh, Engelberth Construction Incorporated to undertake um, this project uh, as a construction manager at risk. So what that means is that they work with us uh, as the estimator on the project for the pre-construction phase, and then uh, provide the city with a guaranteed maximum price. And then um, they, during construction, um, they, they um, hold the price to that amount. So if there's a change order, we would pay above that where it's at, at the owner's instigation. Um, but if a, if, uh, if a subcontractor 
has uh, cost overages, then they would absorb that into their side of the ledger. Um, and if the less money is spent, then that can be returned to the city. So that's how um, CM at risk, construction management at risk contracts work. Uh, and that's um, the model that has uh, been the direction that a lot of public um, projects have been moving in. So, um, so at this point, um, we have a guaranteed maximum price. The construction uh, architecture um, and city team has been working together for over a year uh, in a value ongoing value engineering process um, all throughout the design. Um, so from schematic, when this was originally presented to the council for a vote um, and carried up through um, uh, estimate at the 50% and then an estimate at the 100% and then a re-estimate and then most recently um, the project was rebid. So uh, throughout that process um, the team has been working to reduce costs. There have been um, some challenges uh, throughout that process so there was a um, significant redesign in stormwater and also a delay which has moved the schedule back um, considerably uh, and uh, moved us into more of a winter winter, winter summer winter. Uh, spring uh, type of construction period. Um, so um, I, I can go through this uh, piece by piece. I can cut to the chase. Um, I know you have a lot of, so. Um, it was very clear, your memo. I don't know that I need her to go through it piece yeah, by I don't, piece. Yeah, I don't need you to. It was really clear, Alana. That didn't look like there were any. Yeah. So okay. I'll just say now, uh, I'm going to abstain because I support the library and I don't want to vote against it, but I just, I still don't support the city hall and this isn't what the voters, with the price increase and the value engineering, it's not what the voters voted for. So I'm going to abstain to be consistent with my previous vote, but I won't, I don't want to say I'm against the library because I really want a library in South Burlington and I'm excited about that part of the project. But do we need a motion to, to, to do this? Is that what we need? Approve the resolution. Yeah. I make a motion that we approve the res, approve whatever we need to approve. Second. Uh, any further discussion or comments? Okay. You're abstaining, why? Because I didn't vote for the, this in the first place, and I just don't see the need for the city hall. I haven't been convinced of it, and so this raises the price of the whole project. I still, all I'm, this time. I'm not sold, but I love the library. I'm, I'm really supportive of the library. Yeah. Okay. We're ready for the vote. Sure. Okay. All in favor, signify aye. signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Nay. Mm -hmm. And abstain? Same as name. Okay. So the vote passes. Three, one, with one abstention. All righty. Um, Alana, you're up again. This is authorizing uh, the expenditure for geothermal um, drilling. Uh, so, uh, so a while ago uh, in May, I believe, um, the city council authorized um, the city to issue a notice to proceed um, for uh, geothermal testing and drilling um, for 180 Market Street. Um, at that time, Engelberth uh, began supervising the project and doing coordination um, for, for the project. Uh, the geothermal bills are starting to come in and the question was asked, you know, who's, who's going to pay for this and everyone recommended, well, the city should start, should pay these bills um, in advance of the GMP and, um, and that has a little bit of cost savings um, for the project. Um, but normally uh, uh, an expenditure of this size um, would go through, uh, the city would go through a bidding process for it. Um, in this case, we have a, a high confidence in the, that because we had, there had been competitive quotes early on in the process, um, and because there are so few drilling um, companies that do this type of drilling in Vermont uh, and in the surrounding area, that we have a high degree of confidence in the pricing um, and that it was competitive, and also because of the availability and the need to have it constructed at the same time um, at, in coordination with Market Street, um, we're comfortable with it. Um, but normally, uh, it, it, we wanted to make you know and aware of it because of the size of the billing is above what normally would go to bid for a project. How much is it? It'll be approximately 250000 So this I support because it's clean energy and it's got to be put in. It's the right time to put it in. So even if it's not for a city hall, it'd still be good to have it. So 
<coughs> it is for City Hall, yeah, though. <laughs> it's only good for City Hall. <laughs> keep the heat. We'll keep the heat down. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make a motion that we authorize the expenditure of funds for geothermal drilling. Hopefully there are no PFOAs in that one. Yeah. I just made that motion. Okay, so we have a motion to approve. A second? Second. Any further discussion? Nope, Tom actually stated it quite well. All those in now. favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay. So four to one. Thank you, Alana. Thank you. Thank you for Thanks all your Alana. work. You got so many balls in the air. I don't know how you keep track of them. <laughs> you caught up, Helen. We're only 10 minutes behind. I know. Good so you. item 16, discussion and possible action to warn a public hearing on November 4th, 2019 at, why don't we say 7 p.m. to consider extending the time period during which the interim bylaws are in effect. So remind me the, where we are. Are we coming second up to the, that this will be the second extension. If you recall, the first extension only took us through November, I think, right? Well, oh, do you want to come on. up? I'm sorry. And then and we were told at the time that the planning commission said they would not be ready until at the earliest January. So we knew at the get go that they were needing more time but we could only extend it in three month increments. So this is just a discussion for us to have a possible hearing about extending it. We don't have to decide tonight. That's not what this is about. I, I support another hearing, but I don't support any more than that one extension and that's it. One more extension and that's it. One more after this. We'll have this discussion and then if there's a vote to have one more you know, extension, I, I will support that, but I won't support any more extensions okay. after that. Well, we don't have to make we a don't, decision. I'm just saying that's, yes. that's, that's the way I'm feeling right, right now. Huh? That takes us to a year. That takes that's us to over a year. No, just exactly a year. Six, no, this, three, and three. We have the last year extension brought us to a year, nine months to a year. This next extension will take us to a to, year, to three, year months. three months. Oh, I was three months yeah. off. All right. Yes, I, I agree with you. Just provide a quick right. update. So on so, November 13th, 2018, yeah. the city council, um, adopted the interim bylaws, which uh, were in effect for a nine month time period. Uh, on August 9th, uh, you, so the, the, that last, that first set would have, um, or that first nine month time period would have ended on August 13th. On August 9th, the council voted to extend the interim bylaws for the three month uh, time period after August 13th. So ending November 13th, um, and then November, the, the proposal is just so that, to keep that option open, that you warrant a hearing for November 4th, so that the council can consider um, extending the interim bylaws from November 13th until February 13th, 2020. So I, I move that we warrant a public hearing on November 4th to- At so 7 p.m. 7 p.m. to consider extending the time right? period during which the interim bylaws are. Unless, I'm sorry, 7.30. 7 uh, so it's 7.30 p.m. Yeah. Second. Fourth of Monday? Yes, it is. Okay, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Five, Aye. five in favor. Okay. Well, we vote enough times to get everybody on <laughs> the same page. It, but I'm not going to vote to extend it. But. Huh. That's what I did last sure time. I'm trying wanna... to be consistent here, but it's difficult. Yeah, okay, Let's it keep is. Going. All right. Okay, number 18, financials, July and August. Tom Hubbard. Yeah, thanks, Helen. So we finally get something for you to look at for uh, fiscal year 20. So we get July and August that you've received. We should have September, hopefully, for the next meeting. We're also having department managers write up their uh, narratives for that one. We'll be. Uh, through the first quarter, so um, we'll have we'll have those coming to you soon. It'll have a little more detail that you can read in mm -hmm. terms of a narrative, but uh, just roughly, um, general fund right now expenditures are about 15 percent. Straight line accounting method, we're 16 and two thirds percent way through the budget. Just to give you a, an idea of percentages. Revenues, we're just over 27 percent and majority of that is taxes. We've already had one of our third collections for the year, so um, that, that number is obviously going to be higher. Uh, on the expense side, some of the major items to date, 
we pay out um, some of our uh, contributions to like CCRPC and county court, CCTV, GMT's paid in thirds. Some of those major payments have been made. That's a, that accounts for some of the major expenditures to date. Our paving uh, right now are 523,000 out of our 625 that we have. That does not include the additional 253 that was appropriated. So Justin is is um, is looking to add that to the contract that he has to see if they can get a little bit more work in this fall. This fall. Yep. And and if not, that will be first thing next spring. I know he's going to come to you during the winter this time so that we can be on the June cycle for pavement. So really, as soon as the plants open, we're in. Okay. Um, uh, we've had first quarter payments for our insurance on property, workers' comp, liability insurance. Those are major payments. Vehicle purchases, those typically get done as soon as we go into the next fiscal year. Replacement of uh, DPW trucks, uh, replacement of police cruisers. So those couple of things have uh, uh, were major items in the expense column. Uh, and then I mentioned the paving. On the... Um, on the revenue side, we've received about 12% of the local options tax to date. That was a split between one fiscal year and, and the other. We have three full payments that we'll be receiving during the course of the year. And um, what was what was it that you heard, Kevin, on our uh, on uh, Target store that they had exceeded? Uh, they're well ahead of what their expectations. Yes, yeah, so that's that? definitely target. Target said that. Well, definitely that's what I understand. Are. That's what so I have local heard. Options so tax. is local options revenue ahead of ahead of what it was a year ago? Uh, the, the twelve percent is. Yeah, just like twelve percent it is. Yeah. yeah. Thirty percent of that's just my household alone. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've been asking for a target for a long time, and yet my wife still drives to Plattsburgh. Oh yeah, because it's a big target. She likes taking the ferry. She likes to take the ferry. I mean, no, I yeah. can't blame her, but she <laughs> likes the big target. She doesn't like the small target. She likes the big target. I wouldn't know. I've been well. In the store. She has. <laughs> she's aimed high all her life, right? All I gotta say is this local Target has the best coffee shop because it has these huge south-facing windows. You get a ton of sun exposure if you go in there on a nice day. It's really nice. It is a nice spot. Um, vital records in the clerk's office. Um, <laughs> thanks. I agree with you. Good coffee. Um, vital records in the past, you were required to go to the town that you uh, were born in to get a copy of you can now go to any city clerk's office and get that record oh, we're making money donna has been swamped yeah and um maybe it's just people seeing there's reddit easy parking here rather than going to some <laughs> neighboring communities or you can bike here and, for birth certificates uh, what's that for birth certificates for any vital record yeah. death certificates anything like that so you used to have to go to the exact town and yeah. now you can get them at any city clerk's office in the state that was passed by the state last year okay. so donna has already exceeded her revenue for this year as of September, which you don't see yet but we took a peek at that today so she's substantially going to be increased in her vital records revenue column we're confident that the security measures are equivalent to what they were before i mean when you open it up to the i don't want to go off of that as that she can answer that. Okay. Planning and zoning fees are already at 25%. Ambulance billing is just over 20. Highway state aids come in at 35% already. And the Sobu night out already made $4,000. Get some other events. All from, right. From the, We've completely covered all the costs. Made it in the black. From the, from the food awesome. truck revenue? Food mm -hmm. truck revenue and, and uh, sale percentage of sales. Just, that's the only revenue they get the is from the food trucks, right? Some oh, oh, and from the from the founders and farmers, uh, uh, the beer and wine yeah. concession. Yeah. Oh, there yeah. you go. And sponsors. Let's get some yeah. disco balls well, to do this winter. Sponsors. Pretty good. Nice. So, um, it was anyway. really cool. And the idea is to take that revenue and do additional events. And there's a uh, October brew 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 boo. So, so brew, so brew, so brew, so brew. No, this one's so boo. So brew is. So boo is the um, Halloween, Halloween one, and yeah. so brew is the winter. So brew is the winter. 
So booze? B O O Z E. It's a distiller. Have so you... brew is better. It's Come the... on. Come on. I think so brew is going to be in in the winter. Okay. So anyway, we we've, we've come away from the council understanding we needed to initially sponsor those ourselves yes. to get it going that it would eventually pay for itself and in a couple of years, we've done that. So kudos Very to well, we were very lucky. We had all good, all good weather. And excellent weather. I mean, all excellent. it does is a few nights of Thursday lousy weather and it screws it all up. What? Thursday was the night. Uh, for yes. sure. Um, so that, well, that went well. Let's stick with it. Um, and the enterprise the funds are, it's early. They're all doing fine. Uh, I'm happy to respond to any questions that you have. And we'll have more detail on the September. Remind quarter. me what we were doing to try and keep 100% of our Local options taxes? Didn't we? We were going to. No, that would be a charter. That's issue. a charter change. Yeah. And a, the legislature that's, that's agreeing. No, it just. Is highly unlikely. Because Burlington gets all that, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So and, we have to. We, and St. Albans. Do we have legislation in on that? If they had one. St. Albans doesn't have one yet. Do we have legislation in not on yet. that? Yeah. And this is the second half of the biennium, so I'm not sure it's going to. Okay. I just couldn't remember. Next. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Tom. Good news. Yeah. Good work. Excellent. Okay. Item 19, council appointment to the board of directors of the Champlain Housing Trust. It says we're appointing Kevin. No. No. Kevin's <laughs> going to tell us who well, we're appointing. My understanding is that the Champlain Housing Trust board has a nominating committee, and they nominate somebody, and then it's up to us, or to you, excuse me, pardon me, to appoint. So you can say, no, you don't want to appoint that person, I suppose. But this is the person who they have nominated, and it happens to be uh, Helen Head. Oh, so seemingly they choice. have vetted her and talked with her, and I think she's a phenomenal choice. Yeah, good, so choice. Moved. good choice. Second. Okay, we got a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, other business. Proposed dates for the steering committee. So I can preface that we talked about um, a lot of things when we meet with um, Elizabeth and David, but one was um, to utilize our steering committee, one of the steering committee meetings as a tour for the um, council into the bowels of the school so that we better understand why they need... I don't want to go into anybody's bowels. Come on. Uh. School bowels okay, are school much bowels. nicer. <laughs> Although it's these... like a locker room right here. So um, that's one of the meetings that we decided made sense sooner rather than later so we can understand um, some of their passion about the, the need for building a new school just for informational purposes. Okay. I prefer not the 22nd. Sorry, didn't mean to jump in. And I'm out of town on the 23rd and 24th, and boy, the 22nd is going to be tough because I'm of out that. Of, I've got a field trip that won't get back till 9 o'clock on the 22nd. So well, I'm out on the 22nd. Okay. We can do it after that week. That would be better for me. I can be there. <clears throat> I can make the 22nd work if we need it to. I cannot. Can you, can you, if we put you on Skype on your phone, can no. you just walk around with us on the phone? Not really on this trip. That won't work. Well, um, the following week, on the 30th, we have the um, domestic violence dinner. Um, Free that Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, or Thursday. Thursday's Halloween. Uh, not Thursday. We could go into the bowels early. <laughs> yeah. And, and it costume. could be a good Halloween themed visit. That would be yeah. so bad, actually. <laughs> what would we do? But no, I, well, I should, shall Thursday we isn't good for me. Counter no, with um, the 28th, the 29th, or the. Th well, we don't want to do Halloween. The 28th or the 29th for the. I love early mornings, too. If you guys want to do like a 6 30, 7 a.m. type thing. Huh. Go to it. <laughs> <laughs> Just putting it out there. I don't know if Not you guys are morning people. Okay. <laughs> Not if you want minutes. 
Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think we need oh, minutes for this uh, walkthrough. The, the, the 29th but I'll is, use that as an argument. That's okay. The 29th, so the 29th is what? Is the CCRPC accessory dwelling uh, conference that they're having a special symposium? There. And you're going to it? I was I was thinking of going to it. I'm not committed. Well, I did say I would go, but that means I don't get good that pizza. They always order great pizza for that. So, but I, I can. What change. time is it? I, uh, I think it's six to eight. We'll have food at this. But but that's all right. I can I can change it. I don't have to do that. Have food at the steering committee. The what? Okay. You can have food at the steering committee. If that's well, let's see if you um, can walk, eat yeah. while you walk through the bowels. <laughs> I'm sorry. Anyone, that was all. Has <laughs> anyone ever heard that term it's, before? It's okay. after 10 o'clock. We're, we're getting punchy. And right, then we're the getting second, punchy. okay, and then the second two-hour meeting, we thought that um, we could um, work it in so that we meet with our legislators rather than those breakfasts that none of them, well, I shouldn't say none of them come to, a limited number come to. Um, I will be on a plane to Vegas on November 12th, so that whole week is shot for me. There's a waste of so time. So the fifth, <laughs> that's oh, fine with me. Conference? University conference? Does the fifth work? Yes. David, on task. The fifth work? Okay, so why don't we say work. yes to the, the after, fifth? After 6 So you'll have a meeting the fourth, and then this is this must be a Tuesday, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, Tuesday the fifth. What time are you thinking? I'm, I... Kim, I got seven. class till six. It's usually at seven, usually right? Seven. It's usually yeah. seven. This will be two hours, so seven and nine. It won't be late. Tom will get to bed early. Okay. And then we're going back on the 28th. Is that what the? We're going to propose. We're going to propose the 28th or the 29th. Of October. Of October, for the um, walkthrough. Do we know what time approximately? Is it afternoon or morning? Uh, or evening? That might early morning. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Probably has to be after time. school, right? Yeah. Or should we be? Well, I don't know. No? Yeah? I don't know. Any preference? Well, I've got class both afternoons between 3 and 6, so. Okay. After, so after 6. After, after six, 6 or six. or, or at 7.30 in the morning. <laughs> Not 6.30. 7.30, I can do They don't start classes till 8.30? I might check out after six and see what happens. Okay. Okay. Good. So that's it. Any other business? Oh, that's good. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Yep. I might add it's early, er than on the. Um, Crazy, huh? Good job, yeah. Helen. I'm putting bowels in my calendar here. Okay. <laughs> I've got signatures. Okay. Uh, All in favor? Aye. Aye.